We go live. Yes, sir. We are live now. Please go ahead. Morning, uh, morning to everyone uh, who's joined this uh, session this morning. Uh, our very, very special welcome to Professor Ashutosh Sharma, uh, Secretary Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Uh, he has been with us the last time. He's he has he's patronized this uh, activity of Asochan. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. We have Rohini and Ashwini, my colleagues from Asochan, uh, who are here and uh, distinguished other speakers. We find a lot of speakers coming in from other parts of the world, uh, other departments of government of India, who will be joining and speaking to on uh, on the subject uh, during the uh, the session, which lasts till about 3 p.m. Uh, thank you, media, uh, domestic and international delegates who have kind of joined up this program. Uh, just to give you a sense, uh, uh, ASOCHAM is an organization that you're going to spend your next few hours as to what we do. We are a large organization, has a very, very large membership of medium, small and uh, uh, small and medium and large members uh, across India, uh, cutting across all sections and sectors. I think what has happened to India in the last one and a half years, which is the global pandemic, which has hit us, we came out very well uh, out of it. The second wave has kind of hit us once again and a lot needs to be done. As an organization, as a responsible organization, we have set up a task force which cuts across members and are helping governments at this municipal level, at the district level, at the state level, at the central level to form policy, to help create uh, capacity across hospitals and contribute from our members to create relief to people who are stuck as of now. Our great uh, uh, thanks to the Government of India and the Department of Science and Technology led by the Secretary who have contributed very, very largely in creating that research uh, ecosystem, which is now providing us the indigenous vaccines and solutions that will help us contain this pandemic, if not today, very certainly in the near future. We all have a very, very responsible uh, way to live and behave because this is not going anywhere very soon till the time we are all vaccinated. The number of people that we are, I think it'll be a while before we will be. So all have to act very, very responsibly. So just thought to give you a sense as to what ASOCHAM is doing. Uh, we were, while going through this pandemic, we were hit by the cyclone on the Western coast. So ASOCHAM has contributed in a very large way. Uh, and there are three stages of an, a cyclone. And we are going to go into another one, which is coming on the eastern side of India, which is the YAS one. So it's the pre-stage, the during stage, and the post-stage. So right now we are in the post-stage at, at, uh, at Karnataka, at Goa, at Gujarat. And uh, while we are on the pre-stage with uh, Odisha and uh, West Bengal, helping industry to ensure there is no discontinuity, and especially with the COVID matters, I think it is extremely important to ensure continuity of oxygen to hospitals and supplies and supply chain of the entire network doesn't get uh, choked. Economy is under stress. This could not add another one. And obviously, the target is to ensure zero death, uh, zero loss of life. So, uh, uh, Mr. Ashutosh, thank you so much once again. Uh, this is a very, very important subject. So, I'll bring back the, uh, the the feedback that I wanted to share with all of you. So, thank you for this patient uh, hearing from me. Uh, this is an important subject. It, India has laid the foundation under your leadership. We have had these discussions in the last one year. We found a lot, a lot of products and services are coming through. Quantum computing, con quantum simulation, quantum communication, quantum sensing, the last two have really seen some opportunities which have started to surface. Governments across the world are investing, private sector across the world is investing, and the whole view is that this could be a 22 to $25 billion market in the next few years. Now, this is a huge opportunity which India and Indian industry cannot miss. And therefore, it is extremely important that we all put together our heart and soul to make it happen. I remember uh, Secretary was with us last time and he, in his words, had mentioned how can we get the Indian industry enthused and get them to participate in this. I'm sure lots have happened in the last one year. Lots will happen as we move along. There's a huge uh, success that we have created with our research and development at the way the world is. India has a very, very huge opportunity to play in the research and development, partnering the world to create this uh, new paradigm for India, this huge business that will create new jobs, new uh, strengths for India as we go along. I'm not the expert on quantum, so therefore I'm not going to venture into any of the technology parts of it. But with this, once again, welcome all of you. And may I now invite Rohini, uh, Dr. Rohini, to share her thoughts with us. Thank you very much. Uh, Rohini, over to you. You'll unmute yourself, please. Sure. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks for organizing this despite the challenging times that we are going through. Um, I'd like to spend the uh, next uh, 15 minutes or so 
on quantum computing. We do understand that quantum as a set of technologies is broader than computing. It includes, as Deepak said, communications and sensing, etc. But I will focus on quantum computing as such. Um, I think just to, as an overview, and I'll give a Microsoft point of view, uh, uh, before, but, but before I get there, let me give you a little bit of sense of uh, myself and my role and my connect to this, this topic. Uh, so I serve as the National Technology Officer for Microsoft India. I work on uh, technology areas that are strategic to the country um, and have long-term impact. Uh, and I work with the government and our key partners and customers. Uh, I began my career at AT&T Labs in the mid-90s, to be 1995 to be precise. And if you follow quantum computing, some of the very uh, original and, and famous algorithms in quantum computing were invented at Bell Labs. Uh, Peter Shore developed his Shore's algorithm in 1994, uh, and Love Grover, the famous Grover algorithm, was developed in 1996. In fact, Love Grover was in the same lab in which I was working. Uh, I was working, of course, on deep sub submicron semiconductor design and uh, and simulations thereof, and so uh, had that close touch. But I think if I reflect back on how uh, the semiconductor and the computing industry has transformed the world, I see quantum computing has a, a completely different trajectory to take uh, take the world into. So I'll spend a few minutes on uh, on what is the how does quantum computing really redefine the meaning of computing, and perhaps this is most uh, applicable for people perhaps with a layman understanding of why this is the case. Uh, then I'll speak about the path to scaling quantum computing that Microsoft is taking uh, and how perhaps you may want to get started today because this is a long journey that uh, that organizations, developers, startups will need to embark on uh, to, to be ready for the long haul. So first of all, why should we care about quantum computing? Uh, we've made a lot of advancements in computation. The cloud is here. There are exa exascale computation possible today. But the kind of problems that we are facing, of course, we are looking at the pandemic today, but climate change, whether it is looking at optimizing our natural resources, thinking about energy needs for the for the for the growing economies around the world, these are planet scale problems and they are truly different in nature and uh, that is what people are looking scientists and technologists are looking at quantum computing to solve some of these exponentially uh, complex problems um, i think the the need to understand them will come from a couple of examples and let me just dive right into it uh, and and why that is the case because exponential uh, uh, as as a behavior sometimes uh, is is difficult for human human beings to grab, capture. So if you look at a simple molecule and what you see on the left hand side, a simple molecule, and if you're looking to simulate this and understand the behavior of how this molecule binds with other molecules to form uh, various compounds. Uh, some of the 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 just the computational chemistry problem is by solving classical computers. Very soon you start to see that these problems are not solvable. Meaning the the exponent actually uh, doesn't work, even if you use the very best of uh, of computational power out there. What happens when you bring in quantum computing? And I'll come to that in a second. Is that the nature of the uh, of the problem? Uh, is then brought to what we may call polynomial scale. So the power is then, then being able to apply quantum physics and quantum mechanics uh, uh, behavior to change an exponential problem into potentially a polynomial problem. And that is the fundamental promise of quantum computing. Let's look at this a little bit more because, uh, again, I'm keeping the next few minutes for, for the layperson. When we look at uh, 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 what you're seeing on the picture is when you go deep down into a computer, you have basically bits and uh, bits that build up to create bytes and then uh, and then large circuits, and these bits are uh, are functioning in either zeros or ones, and that is what creates all the circuits uh, to to behave and uh, and that's what's happening under, under, underneath. But if you kind of go down a little bit further and understand why this is important. Uh, when you think about bits and you need to now uh, look at how these have to, uh, the, the different combinations, even with a four bit computer, 
uh, and I'm bringing it very simply to make the point that if we even if we look at a four bit computer to really look at all possible com combinations of the four bit computer, you need to have a 16 possible combinations, and that is what a classical computer uh, does in terms of being able to search for a solution space. Now, what a quantum computer does is is has something called superposition, and it's a, it's a tremendously interesting physical concept, uh, wherein the the qubit, which is called the fundamental building block of block of a quantum computer, is uh, actually in both zero and one state at the same time. It's a it's a uh, it's a very in, uh, curious behavior, uh, but what we we call it as superposition allows you to have just two bits that are uh, able to cop capture information that that you would you would need for for uh, you know a, a different uh, scale in a in a classical computer. Now, if you look at four bits, and we kind of thought about uh, you know how these four bits go about capturing sixteen possible combinations, right? Because four bits can be in sixteen possible different combinations. Now, the same thing if you go down and look at a classical computer, uh, sorry, a quantum computer. These sixteen possible combinations are then possible through superposition to be captured just in four qubits. Now, all of this may seem very academic. It may seem, you know, what are we just talking about? Four qubits, et cetera, but it really adds up. That's the power of the exponent. When we start to see that the 16 possible can bring into just four qubits in a quantum computer. Now, if we look at what does it mean in terms of real uh, simulations of quantum computers? Let's look at the situation where you just have 20 qubits. Now, 20 qubits will need some 16 meg of memory, um, a little bit technical, but uh, that's kind of what you might see on your mobile phone. Now, take it to 30, that's just 10 more qubits. Uh, that needs 16 gigabytes of memory, which is typical of, let's say, a laptop or a machine that you might be on. So, adding 10 times qubits is actually adds 100 times more memory required, which is now, if you bring it down further, 50 qubits, it's about 16 petabytes, and that's like having a few racks of a data center. It's important to understand if you just from 50 qubits, now you, the power of the exponent is such that you take it to 230 qubits, that is 10 to the power 80 bytes of memory, which is larger than the number of particles in our visible universe. I think it's difficult for human mind to even comprehend the power of the exponent. Now, that is the promise of quantum computing because it allows us to solve problems that are complex, that are exponential in nature. But it's also important to realize that the it, quantum computing is not going to solve every possible problem. It needs to be a specific kind of problems. And therefore, it is important to realize that what are those special kinds of problems? Today, there are quantum computers which are a few qubits, uh, but as they scale, they'll become more powerful. But even so, I think it's two things have to be realized. One, a quantum computer has to solve that problem faster, better than a classical computer. And second, it has to bring to that in a more economic fashion. But even after that, I think it's Im important to realize that quantum computer and uh, computers are essentially great at computing. They are aren't great today at reading and writing large amounts of data, which is where it comes in that the kinds of problems that they should be thought about to solve are ones which require small data, big compute. And that is the class of problems that comes in optimization, simulation of the physical systems. And so our fundamental belief is that as we, even as quantum computers scale to bigger computers, you'll have to think about them as very special purpose computers until they become really at a, a different scale to solve problems that are exponential in nature, but are small data problems. Now, let me come to the Microsoft point of view on how we are thinking about building a scalable uh, quantum computer. Uh, it's because it is more just than just about good qubits. 
Yes, qubits are required, but then you have to build all the layers of a computing stack. And Microsoft has been the business of doing that for decades now, understanding what it takes, not just for the hardware to work, but also the control systems that have to interact with that hardware, manage that quantum hardware, programming models and frameworks, applications, services, and solutions. And that is what it takes to really have that full stack approach to quantum computing and to make it work. So the kind of approach we are taking is a, a three horizon approach, if you will. We are looking at a horizon. These are these are not meant to be timelines. They are meant to be thinking about the waves in which we are thinking about it, and we are thinking of it at scale uh, uh, on the cloud and how we will we are working with our partner ecosystem to make sure that we are capturing value even as the technology is growing and developing uh, ma major strides. So in horizon one. We look, we are looking at extending and building the ecosystem and really growing the foundation, which means there are certain areas around optimization, what we call quantum inspired algorithms that can be uh, solved using quantum uh, uh, fundamentals and, and inspirations and algorithms, but can be solved on classical computers, perhaps around on FPGAs and GPUs and some of the larger uh, compute workloads that we have. We are also will be working to build an early partner quantum hardware uh, and the ecosystem of developers and solution providers. In Horizon 2, we expect to really migrate uh, some of the future quantum workloads into the cloud, develop further advancements into the partner hardware, and we are ourselves working on a uh, on a revolutionary way of thinking about quantum, which is called a topological qubit. So some of our early uh, hardware we expect to have available on uh, on Azure uh, in the form of a first party quantum hardware, even as we work with our partners on 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 the technologies they are developing. And of course, going forward, um, really looking at scaling that uh, with partner hardware and accelerating commercial applications. So it is really a three horizon approach because we see some uh, interesting use cases today, and yet we think that preparing the ecosystem for the future is the is the direction we are taking as we uh, as we move forward. And how are we doing that? Um, it's a very open ecosystem approach. Uh, we are working with hardware vendors, quantum hardware uh, 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 startups, as well as uh, uh, larger organizations, software and solutions to create an open ecosystem. Uh, there is a language called QSharp and a quantum development kit, which is open sourced and available to the broader quantum community. QSharp is a universal language, uh, which means it can run on any gate based quantum computer. We are bringing the world scale capability of Azure, which is uh, which brings in scalability, security and reliability as the fundamental basis through which quantum is offered as a service. Uh, and we are working with some of our customers on early impact. Uh, by building solutions and creating that uh, those uh, quantum inspired algorithms uh, and some of the things I talked about earlier. There are two fundamental uh, approaches to how uh, the, the Azure quantum and quantum development kit work. One is I said an optimization because there are class of problems which are not solvable or are, are still having challenges using standard methods of optimization, whether it's simulated any link or some of the other technologies in optimization. Where certain areas from quantum, which are quantum inspired methodology, quantum inspired optimization techniques can help solve some some of these difficult problems, whether it has to do with traffic, whether it has to do with uh, with energy, etc. So that's an area of optimization, which is which is one leg of uh, of approach that we're taking. The other is on quantum computing itself, which is where the Q sharp uh, language comes in, working with the quantum development kit, uh, and where you can either run on quantum hardware, which many of our partners' hardware is available on Azure, uh, as well as do simulations. Uh, of of uh, quantum computing on quantum simulators. So, in uh, as 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 I mentioned earlier, it's not about just developing the qubit. It's also about creating that ecosystem, which is where a network comes into play. So, what you will see here are partners who are uh, who are creating this quantum hardware that is available through Azure. It's also a set of range of uh, solutions, software, and hardware across the industry, which brings about that kind of innovation at scale. 
Of course, we are working with some of our customers to create uh, solutions for their uh, challenging problems today, whether it is whether it is on on healthcare, uh, on on automotive and traffic, etc. So many of those are happening, and as well, we are working with university research and curriculum partners. In fact, you'll see two Indian uh, organizations which are part of our quantum uh, network from the university front, wherein that um, that uh, academic as well as developer and student ecosystem building has to happen for the long haul. So just to wrap up, uh, it is a long haul for us and we are working, as I said, on development tools on working with Azure Quantum as an open cloud where you can run these tools, uh, whether it's from with using classical hardware environments in terms of simulation, but also trying uh, some of the powerful quantum hardware that is available to our partners. And finally, we are working uh, with our uh, team of quantum experts work with uh, specific customers who want to then uh, create custom solutions uh, using quantum technologies. So I'll end with a video which is basically talks about how uh, how we are thinking about quantum and I'll, I'll share um, uh, certain resources that you have in terms of moving forward. Uh, Dr. Roini, just to interrupt you, how long is this video? It's just uh, two minutes. Shall I not do it? I can, I can not I, play, that's I think, fine. Yeah, let's drop this. Yeah, thank okay, you. We can fine. always play that back later. Thank yeah, you. So I think, as I was mentioning earlier, um, the need for developers, students, uh, for uh, for companies to get involved in the in the quantum journey is now. Uh, there, as I mentioned, there are vibrant communities on Q Sharp on on quantum development kit which are out there. Uh, some of the links are in front of you. Do join them. Uh, provide us feedback. Uh, and I think it's a, it's the time is now to get started on this journey because the promise is there, but it is a journey and has to be thought about as such in different horizons. So thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rohini. I think a journey is what it is. And I think uh, while we know where the goals are and each time when we find that the goal is visible to us, it changes and that's all about finding new answers to uh, existing problems and newer problems. And, you know, it's always said that, you know, I have answers for questions, uh, the questions I know. What about the answers to the question? The questions I don't know. So I think you take me into that space and uh, what what a time for me to uh, now invite uh, our secretary, uh, science and technology, uh, government of India, Professor Ashutosh Sharma. Thank you so much and over to you, sir. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm indeed delighted that SOCHAM is holding the second annual international uh, uh, conference, India conference on quantum technology conclave. Um, and the theme uh, is unlocking the potential of quantum uh, for India. Uh, so this is indeed very good. I recall fondly uh, about a year ago, the first conference that you have had, uh, which brought together indeed a very good roadmap uh, for quantum in India. Uh, and um, uh, you gave a very good introduction today as well as in the last conference. And then we have seen some deep, uh, deep analysis of what the quantum roadmap ahead would be by Dr. Rohini Shri um, uh, and all the speakers that you have lined up today. Uh, they are all very deep minds working in quantum. Uh, we live in uncertain times now, and so that certainly matches the power of quantum. Uh, quantum is, to my mind, it looks like the final frontier. As a final frontier, in fact, I thought about that 25 years ago uh, when there was a nano mission uh, launched in India and in fact elsewhere globally. So is there, how small can you get? I mean, this looks like the final frontier, uh, nano science and technology. Uh, but so if you go down further, clearly it is quantum. Um, and it's very intriguing. In fact, it's one of the very few domains of knowledge uh, where uh, deep understanding lags behind applications and technology. Uh, so, you know, often people say, look, we don't understand what quantum is, but understand me, of course, we understand equations and everything else. Uh, we don't understand interpretations or deep understanding of what it all means. Uh, how does it even impact maybe stuff like consciousness and what happens in neurons and stuff? So at, at what point it, it starts impacting our day-to-day -day life and indeed, how is it an integral part of that? And the rise of quantum technology brings to us, uh, you know, in a rather compelling way, uh, uh, the fact that quantum is not that remote uh, and that indeed th this may be uh, what we are looking at for all foreseeable future 
uh, is indeed the beginning, a uh, long way to go. Um, of course, we have learned a lot in this one year since we met last time. We, we have had new lessons and those lessons are brought home uh, by that little nano virus, uh, if you would. Uh, so, um, virus. So, one of the things that we have learned indeed uh, in terms of technology and if you wanted to really develop it, whether you start with, uh, go back to the beginning of the first wave, uh, no imports were possible. There were no ventilators. There was no great diagnostics. There were not even PPEs and N95 masks. Uh, and forget about, you know, developing uh, a vaccine uh, because people said it takes 10 years globally and we have had very few examples of working on vaccines uh, in the country, just a couple of successful uh, examples. Uh, so it, it was very heartening that that with a common purpose, which is a shared purpose and a common vision, which is a shared vision and having very clear objectives uh, that triple helix could work together, which is industry and startups on one side, uh, the knowledge uh, institutions like IITs, uh, R&D labs and universities on another corner of the triangle uh, and the government. I do so recall so many, uh, you know, very, very important lessons in all of this. Uh, you know, somebody, uh, let's say an incubator calls and says, we need uh, 50 lakhs of uh, working capital by tomorrow morning. And we were able to do that. Uh, it would never happen in what we call the normal times. Uh, it might take six months, uh, you know, in the government processes. And think about government processes, the point that uh, Dr. Shivatsa made about linear versus exponential processes. Uh, in fact, the virus has also taught us about the fact that human brain doesn't process the power of exponentials very intuitively. Uh, and so, uh, you know, going down into second wave, uh, you know, exponentials start rather modestly and they stay below some linear curve, uh, but then boom, I mean, before you are actually prepared for it, uh, it's gonna hit you with the full power. Uh, and, and indeed, uh, while our, uh, while our uh, you know, the way we think about things, the way we act in this world, uh, those are all linear processes, most of them with a small slope, the small changes here, there, uh, right? And we know how to deal with them, how to adjust to them, how to mitigate them, how, how to adapt to them. Uh, and so uh, certainly the power of exponentials is something that has to be integrated more in our thinking uh, and uh, disruptive technologies that you start today. For example, quantum is one example, uh, but there are other things on horizon, intelligent machines, uh, well, sustainable development, climate change. Uh, of course, that climate change perhaps is one of those things which are rather enigmatic because it might appear to be linear over long periods of time uh, until the whole North Pole disappears, for example, and boom, there is a catastrophe. Uh, so, a whole lot of these things, uh, which are a combination of linear, exponential, et cetera, we have to be fully prepared for it, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, so, as far as quantum uh, mission, quantum technologies and cultivating them uh, in our country are concerned, um, as we uh, said, uh, look, last year, a couple, we, we actually woke up to it about three years ago in Department of Science and Technology, because one of our mandates to be, in a sense, a little bit ready for the future and to seed that capacity and capability in our scientific ecosystem uh, to be prepared. Now, of course, the historical model uh, of doing science technology in this country was uh, kind of in silos. So we, I do something in my lab and, and I produce top world-class knowledge, but that knowledge has no connect uh, with the outside world. It has connect in terms of papers scientific papers, good quality papers, and training our uh, manpower, uh, human resources. Uh, but beyond that, it didn't have a direct connect uh, with the innovation, with the industry, uh, with the startups, uh, and indeed with the market and opportunities, uh, socioeconomic opportunities that we could create using that knowledge. Essentially, a disconnect between knowledge creation and knowledge consumption. Uh, so, uh, now the reason I'm saying that, that in, um, uh, uh, you know, any technology missions, 
that we launch today or tomorrow in the future must take into account very strongly this connect from the beginning. Uh, and so there have been, as we know, that technologies hunt in pairs. Uh, and it was, there are so many compelling examples of that. The one I often quote, my first job after PhD was in a company that ceased to nearly exist 10 years after uh, that. Uh, digital photography, the rise of that. Another company which was into uh, were leaders actually in personal computers and computing, but thought that there was not much. Um, oh, can you hear me? Okay, I, I lost you for a moment. Uh, but anyhow, this company thought there is not much scope, not much impact for personal computer, personal computing, not much traction out there. But this because technology is always hunt in pairs. Uh, and they, um, they, they, there is a co-arising of technologies in the proximal areas that support each other. So digital photography would make no sense, personal digital photography, unless we had personal computers. Uh, personal computers wouldn't make much sense unless we had personal uh, applications to run on them like digital photography. Uh, and, and so it all comes together uh, unless we are able to see beyond our immediate um, domain of what we do. Uh, so while uh, modern scientists, we get very narrow and very deep, which is a good thing. Uh, but at the same time, somebody is ought to be looking out for the horizontals uh, as well and try to pull them in and integrate that uh, in terms of opportunities. Um, so anyhow, I will just very quickly summarize what uh, is being done about quantum uh, uh, technology in India. So going back three years, the first thing we did is did a mapping of the people and the groups and the resources in the country uh, that could be, uh, you know, have the potential to work in that area. Some of them could be repurposed. Uh, you know, that becomes a very popular word now uh, to repurpose everything. Uh, and uh, so, but beyond that, there were already good capability and more has to be cultivated. Uh, so working on that, those networks, uh, we launched a modest program I think it's on the order of 200 crore rupees or, or some, I forget the exact sum, uh, over three years. And the idea was that meanwhile, while we cultivate these uh, capabilities in the system uh, so that they are ready for bigger things uh, to be able to absorb bigger resources and to be able to make use of, of them in a reasonable way. Uh, so uh, th this was the beginning. Uh, and indeed, after that, um, many uh, ministries uh, like MIT, ISRO, DRDO, uh, all been working towards some goals in quantum technologies. Uh, some of them are of a strategic nature. Uh, some of them would be of more open uh, source nature. Uh, MIT in particular uh, has had a lot of um, stakeholding uh, in this particular uh, suit of technologies. Um, so going beyond that, then uh, there was the union budget 2020 announced a national mission on quantum technologies and applications uh, with a total budget outlay of rupees 8,000 crores for a period of five years, which basically means extends the horizon extends to eight years because whatever you fund in the fifth year continues the momentum and activities uh, beyond that to up to eight years. Uh, and of course, more things may develop uh, as we know that future is very hard to predict. Uh, predictions about the future are very hard. That's what they say. Um, and of course, um, uh, predictions about the past are very accurate uh, while coming from present or from the future. So there is a little bit of asymmetry about these things. Uh, but anyhow, as we know that other countries like US, Canada, Australia, China, have made uh, advancements and, and funding and investment in this suit of technologies. Uh, however, uh, you know, if I were to go back to uh, a very basic technology like uh, semiconductor processing, uh, right? We, it is absolutely no doubt that we missed the bus in a big way there. Uh, so while uh, things started, good sense, you know, in the 70s, 80s, something burned down, something people lost interest and they didn't quite see the importance and impact of that sector. Uh, and we we miss the bus. Uh, that ought not to happen with other technologies which are evolving fast and are on the horizon. Uh, one example is the cyber physical systems, the whole AI universe, if you would. 
Uh, so it had everything, uh, robotics, uh, industry 4.0, IoT, big data, and applications in different uh, sectors and applications in different aspects of life, all of that. So we started a mission uh, on cyber physical systems uh, with initial investment of 4,000 crore rupees. Uh, and so anyway, activities have been a little bit slow going through this last one year because IITs, everybody, labs and stuff, they are partially working during this time or shut down and so on. But it, it, it would have a good impact. We already set up 25 hubs uh, of cyber physical systems across the country. And the reason I'm referring to that in the context of quantum technology mission, uh, there is a very particular reason for it, that the architecture and the structure and the processes of that mission are radically different from the way we have been doing things in the past. Uh, and the same thing would also be the best of those ideas would be duplicated uh, in the quantum mission. So what are those ideas and why is it uh, is important both for academic researchers and for the industry? Uh, so first of all, these hubs that I talk about of cyber physical systems, they are not uh, isolated domains or different aspects of knowledge, but in fact, an integrated chain of knowledge uh, from knowledge creation, we call it basic research, applied research, technology, translation, incubation uh, through incubators and startups, uh, a research park like the kind you see in IIT Madras, uh, and human resource generation at different levels. So all of that basically uh, is to be integrated seamlessly in that hub. Uh, so it's a, that people are connected, so that there is a direction of even about the basic research. Some of the basic research, of course, will always be blue sky, and it should it has to be encouraged in fast moving areas at the cutting edge of knowledge. Uh, like, okay, I mean, quantum technology is a very good example of that. But even there, if industry were to say, look, this is something that we don't understand, can there be a better scientific solution to this? And so on. So it gives an early direction uh, to our researchers. Uh, at the same time that they would learn about uh, what could be the fruitful directions. So each of these hubs actually is co-owned by three entities and it's a section eight company. So each of the hubs at arm's length from the government, at arm's length from my office and from all my officers' offices uh, is not really required because what is actually required is that there is a stakeholder base which understands the problem and they have the flexibility to be able to use resources uh, in the way which is optimal. Uh, so uh, this uh, co-ownership co of these hubs uh, of mission is basically three way, uh, which is uh, one third industry, uh, one third uh, government line ministries that have interest in providing direction and further resources uh, for those problems. And one third, of course, uh, the knowledge partners, academia, R&D labs, and so on. So I don't wish people to look at it like, oh, oh, hey, there's some resources, we can also use it. No, actually you have to own them. Uh, so it is a different concept uh, that there is a co-ownership of all of this, uh, which means that we, we can really work together, we can bring in our problems, we can bring in additional resources, uh, that one can give money to industry, one can receive money from industry. So it has to be a two-way interaction uh, between our, uh, you know, academic scientists uh, and startups and industry. Uh, so this would also be at the core uh, of quantum mission. Uh, so it, it requires understanding from both sides uh, that it actually brings huge value to both the partners. Uh, so even though we are not used to looking at it like that, uh, and we sometimes look at it as zero sum game and people are a little, little bit suspicious about if somebody is gaining something, what do I lose in it? Uh, you know, so those are all, you know, I think those are history and we, we really have to step out of that and work for a common purpose there. Um, as was mentioned by a Finance Minister Shimati Nirmala Sitharaman in Union Budget 2020 speech, and I quote, that quantum technology is opening up new frontiers in computing. Uh, it's expected that lots of commercial applications would emerge uh, and our new economy is based on innovations that disrupt established business models. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, 3D printing, 
drones, DNA data storage, quantum computing, etc., are rewriting the world economic order. With all that in mind, uh, so industry has a wonderful opportunity, and I would say academia has a wonderful opportunity uh, because uh, you know when we look at the real problems, when we look at these interconnections between so many different silos of knowledge and activities, it's truly, truly inspiring. It's truly exciting. Uh, and so that excitement as it percolates uh, by interaction uh, between industry and academia, uh, this would bring a huge value uh, to all of us. And like I was saying, you know, technology is hunting pairs, even though I have yet to figure out uh, the very uh, important pairs for quantum technology, uh, but it's clear uh, that this happens. And because of that, DST in last four years, five years, uh, have actually launched uh, several different new streams of technology missions. I had talked about one of them, cyber physical systems, quantum in the making, but uh, right now happening at a little modest level. Uh, electric mobility uh, is another very compelling aspect. And in, 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 indeed, not just electric mobility, but electric storage in general, as we move to renewable energy, that becomes a huge problem uh, in order to balance the grid because of intermittent nature of renewable energy uh, coming from there. Uh, very interesting things are happening in that domain. Additive manufacturing, which is another, I would call it really part of this digital universe. So from digital, uh, you know, digital information, which drives digital manufacturing, uh, whether it is industry 4.0, or in particular, additive manufacturing like 3D printing uh, is going to have a huge, huge impact. Uh, in fact, we are, uh, you know, uh, designing uh, what we call the technology park tech dome uh, in the new Vista, uh, which would be coming up. Uh, really, uh, you know, state of the art uh, presentation that inspire excitement in young minds uh, about this whole AI universe, digital universe, uh, what have you. Uh, in fact, we are going to also uh, invite participation from industry uh, to showcase uh, their very new concepts. I, of course, certainly would reach out to Microsoft and other people as to what can be showcased in this very, uh, very uh, compelling uh, technology muse museum of the kind that does not exist in India. And in fact, it should be even better than in some elements, better than what exists elsewhere. And so all of this is coming together with great force. As far as quantum technologies are concerned, uh, these particular missions uh, are, uh, are addressing quantum computing, quantum computers, quantum communication, quantum key distribution, encryption, crypt analysis, quantum devices like sensing, quantum materials, quantum clock, and so on, um, and so on. So it means, you know, quantum algorithms and some of which uh, Dr. Shivatsa uh, talked about. Uh, areas of focus for the mission will be, as I pointed out, both fundamental science translation, technology development, human uh, infrastructural resources, innovation startups to address uh, all of this in a seamless way. Um, and the future everyday applications of quantum technology, uh, which may be in um, Autonomous vehicle navigation, weather prediction, transportation planning, pharmaceutical. There are a whole lot of what we may call the usual suspects, uh, and which is all very good to see there. But uh, we also know uh, some of them would be more compelling applications, some of them would be peripheral. Um, as was also pointed out by, by Dr. Shivatsa, uh, that quantum computing, for example, is not equally good for everything, um, uh, while that may be a good selling point. Uh, is really not good for everything, uh, and so we ought to focus on things that this is really good for, uh, and I'm sure that that's going to happen. So we should harness the potential of quantum technology and its applications to keep the country in league with the ones that we compete with and also cooperate with. Uh, so by the way, thinking about cooperation, uh, I must also point out another aspect about these technology hubs, uh, which would be similar in quantum mission, uh, is that all of them are empowered uh, to sign MOUs with the foreign entities uh, to also uh, bring on board uh, the scientists that they want from abroad uh, by paying them not the Indian government salary, uh, but whatever is found to be suitable uh, for that. So essentially that 
you take your decisions, you make good use of your resources and money uh, and not be driven only from the top. Uh, so it also means it requires greater responsibility and leadership in our scientific community, as well as an industry that cooperates and co-owns co -owns, uh, these missions. We are not used to it. Okay, so it's basically, uh, it's saying, look, uh, the point is people say, just give me this money, tell me what to do, maybe I'll do something, All right? But here it is basically saying, look, uh, you are the, the writer of your uh, future. Uh, it's just like a corporation. Okay, saying here is what the resources that would be available, but what you make out of these resources and uh, the accountability that comes with it uh, to your stakeholder base, um, you know, all that has to be respected. And that requires a bit of paradigm shift in the way we do science, the way we think about it. And it's all about the cultivating leadership at every level in our scientific community. Uh, and for them to see the advantages of working with everybody else uh, and, and not, not just be uh, so, uh, so, so siloed uh, that, you know, our job ends with uh, creating good knowledge and publishing it. Uh, and, and it's a lot more. Uh, so essentially, it is not just the weakness in our knowledge producing systems. We know that I often cite the fact uh, that India is number three in number of scientific publications in the world, despite our constraints and inputs which basically means that our scientists, when they have a clear purpose and they are empowered, they can deliver. And that's what I was saying about today, we are getting actually very good diagnostics, all made within three months. It developed in three months to eight months. Now the new ones which are coming up are going beyond the usual things. I mean, now, you know, now your point is that you ought to be able to recognize mutations, not just say that you have COVID-19, you must also be able to quantify how much of antibodies you have, so you can see how the fading of antibodies occurs after vaccination or after infection. So, so basically a lot of cutting edge work is happening, but with good speed and enthusiasm. And I think if we can inject uh, those elements, those learnings in everything that we do in the future, I think the future is going to be very, very bright indeed. Um, so this uh, I may conclude there and extend my good wishes uh, to the uh, event which is happening today. Uh, and I'm sure that this is a great learning opportunity. Uh, all of these events, whether you know we have a workshop, we have a conference, uh, we have any kind of chatting of people together, there must be, if we can define a very good outcome for these events, then you know it would have even a greater meaning, uh, even beyond the people who are participating directly uh, so, you know, I would urge all of us, uh, all the speakers that come later when they talk to each other, uh, if you think of some new actionable items, if you think about, look, what is it, how we can do it, what needs to be done and so on, uh, which may not be in our consciousness right now. Uh, so I would urge all of you to please put down your thoughts, uh, which we think about the kind of something which is delivered uh, out of these conferences. If I were to look back on my life, alas, uh, I don't know. I mean, I must have, I can't remember the number of conferences attended. Must be in several hundreds. But then, like I said, alas, because I can't really remember much about uh, what actually happened there. Uh, beyond the fact that I made a presentation, other people made presentation. They all uh, said that their presentation was the best. Uh, and all of that happened, which is very good. And we talked outside a little bit, we made some networking and so on. But there was no document ever uh, which said actually, you know, where are we? Who are we? What is the status? What is it that we need to do uh, right beyond some little homelies? Uh, so this is something that I would like to share with everybody uh, that some of it we fail to do in our lives. But, you know, jab jago tabhi savera. Uh, and today is a good day to wake up and, and take control. Thank you so very much. Uh, enjoy your meeting uh, and, and, you know, make uncertain things certain by quantum technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ashutosh Sharmaji. Uh, I think I so chamme to apne sabera karwa diya. So what we do is, and we commit to you is that hum, uh, normally when conference happen, uh, we normally come with a report that is put up forward. But what we do is we promise you two things. Not only will we do a report of this, 
but we will also come to you to create a report on the way forward on the policy side on the investment side and the opportunity side so that when we come to the next thing it is more action more uh, for beyond the department and where the action has to happen so these two commitments we do and my colleagues are uh, here so we will ensure that is i think you touched upon two things and before i would go to ashni ji to give the formal word of thanks i think there are two things that you have told me and that connect with me when i work with people because asocham is only people and uh, teamwork silos and you talked about the connected world it connects so beautifully with me and uh, i keep telling and working with my people to tell them that you know if regulation is changed please inform the steel man please inform the pharmaceutical uh, practice please inform this by the time they find it's too late and therefore you give a very very important message and i firstly thank you for that it's extremely important i think the repurpose of everything that you spoke about is great but i'm going to dig in and make a prediction sir that i'm not going to be sitting in this room this chair more than 3 months i will come out to my office i will be out on the picnics i'll be out on my hiking i will go to a golf course and i promise you that all of us will be out all of us need to ensure that we follow the rules and we kill that exponential rest everywhere you make the exponential work but this one exponential i wish and we should all stand together to kill this exponential we don't want this exponential which is the virus thank you so much uh uh professor ashutosh for this and uh, yeah, you, if i may quickly add to that uh my office has never been shut down all these years uh through the covid 19 period uh, it's just that what i did nobody comes in this office uh, so that's the reason i'm not wearing a mask as soon as i get out i wear a mask and if i have been wearing n95 mask all along uh and sometimes i say i am the only negative in the sea of positives uh you know which is a bad thing to say in normal times but now the things are flipped uh right uh, instead of saying i'm a positive guy uh, in the sea of negatives i say the other way around and indeed uh, i think uh, yeah I, i think we we cannot repeat it enough uh, please everybody take uh, to covid appropriate behavior that we all all know and just add one more thing to it maximum ventilation Uh, as we know that you know this aerosol transmission uh, which is uh, more recent more recent origin uh, you know add to uh, add to that the total total ventilation uh, you say my my doors are always open for everybody uh, except the virus uh, and then we keep the door doors open uh, and windows open and everything uh, i haven't any doubt by right kind of behavior uh, we can also balance the livelihood and the economy and all those options there thank you so very much for bringing this uh, you know uh, to the table thank you very much ashri ji back to you um thank you uh, on behalf of sochem uh, i want to extend our uh, very warm vote of thanks to professor ashutosh sharma ji uh, for his visionary address and taking time for this event uh, also i would like to extend a special thanks to dr rohini for inspiring us at sochem to do this important discussion uh deepak sood ji from sochem for providing leadership to industry and bringing government on the table uh definitely there are many things to be done together in this area uh starting from incentive alignment to industry thinking out of box bringing new services and products for masses at the same time for special purpose applications uh so th this event has gained its reputation uh, by looking at diverse set of uh, participant uh, and number of participants this time and we are hopeful it is going to provide a good platform for this discussion to be taken further in the coming times and we hope india is going to play a big role in coming times in this area i would also like to thank our all the delegate delegate delegates in this event and the partners those supported this event that is google microsoft qpi ai renew power and tcil in the end thank you so much and jai ashwini thank you very much sir uh, thank you sir can i request uh, shri arun prati professor arun kumar prati ji to kindly make his address arun ji you are making a presentation
so yeah i have to share my screen uh, there is an option uh, just near your uh, mic to share the screen yeah. you can see the screen so you can see yes we can see your screen okay so good morning everyone and uh, it is a great pleasure uh, to see that SHM is organizing this event. Uh, so before I share my thoughts, uh, let me tell you a few words about my journey in the field of quantum computing. So I started uh, my research some 30 years back uh, in the field of quantum computing, quantum information. So at that time, I was uh, alone. And even I was uh, asked, you know, that why do you want to do research in quantum computing because it may not have any future. But I was convinced that this field is not only have future, but it is going to change the future. So with that self motivation, I started my journey and uh, I'm very happy to see that over the last 20 years, uh, there are many institutes, many groups working in this field in India. And uh, there are many faculties, <clears throat> many young students doing PhD and uh, not only that, government under leadership of uh, Professor Sarma, you know, DST has taken a uh, great initiative in this quantum technology. And uh, now government, academic people and industry, private people, everyone is interested to do something to, uh, you know, to bring this technology to really, you know, commercial reality. So that is really uh, pleasing to see that uh, something positive is happening. Okay, so the brief, uh, note let me go to my slide so i'm going to tell a little bit about future of quantum computing so myself uh, arun pati from quantum information and computation group uh, at harish chandra research institute allahabad uh, so i will briefly tell you why this quantum computing is exciting and some applications in quantum computing and what is the big goal of quantum information technology and what we need to do to achieve our goal. So, so before you appreciate uh, the notion of quantum computing, you have to uh, realize that physics and computation, they are not really different subject. Because to store and process information, you have to bring some physical system. And computation is essentially a physical phenomenon happening inside a physical system. So this was the great insight uh, that was realized by Ralph Landauer, and this view leads to so called physics of computation. And this uh, insight played a major role, you know, uh, in trying to design reversible logic gates in classical computation, which ultimately led to the theory of quantum computing. And all of you will agree that fundamental work in physics ultimately leads to technological evolutions. And you can cite many examples, starting from computers to internet to electronic devices, communication systems, and recently this emerging technology, what we call quantum technology. So how did this field start? So it all started by uh, one of our great physicists, Richard Feynman, who realized that if you want to simulate complex quantum system on a classical computer, you will not be able to do that efficiently. So the next question was, what will happen if you store information in quantum system itself? That means you use quantum system to simulate quantum system itself. Okay, so with that little hint, which came in 1982, David Dice thought more deeply about this uh, question, and then he came up with this so-called idea of quantum computing in 1985. And what he thought is that if you exploit this quantum mechanical superposition, that allows you to store and process information in a new way. And that is the whole starting point of your quantum computing. And quantum computer essentially is a device that performs computation using principles of quantum theory, the ultimate theory of nature. And already, you know, I mean, when you think of a classical computer, you have a collection of bits which can exist in two distinct states, like up and down or on and off, and you can store one bit of information. But when you the same thing on a quantum system like spin of electron or polarization of photon and so on, you can do that. But at the same time, you know that quantum theory has this remarkable feature that 
the system can not only exist in distant state but can also exist in a linear combination of this up and down and this particular combination is what it makes so dramatically different compared to classical bit and this is essentially a quantum bit and when you think of a quantum computer you take a collection of quantum bits and on those collections you apply certain suitable unitary transformations which and then you run your quantum algorithm but once you want to do a measurement, the quantum bit will collapse to either up and down. So essentially, you will end up with the classical bit. So you can imagine that your classical computer is a measurement version of quantum computer. So until you do a measurement, you can preserve the coherence, this quantum superposition, and you can maintain your quantum computer. So if you ask the question, what gives power, what gives uh, uh, superiority to quantum computer. So there are a couple of things you can identify. One is the quantum superposition, quantum entanglement, quantum correlation, and these leads to this massive parallelism. And you can exploit these non-classical features to get the desired speed up compared to classical computer. Coming to applications of quantum computer, uh, it is a big hope that quantum computers may be able to solve problems that are too complex for classical computers or supercomputers. So in early 90s, the first algorithm was discovered by Doris and Joja, that was the uh, kind of uh, a simple task to decide the nature of some function. And that particular task on a classical computer will take exponential number of steps. But on a, class on a quantum computer, you can do just in one step. And all of you know, uh, in 1994, this famous source algorithm came, which is prime filtration. And in 1997, Groho discovered this quantum source algorithm, which can give a quadratic speed up compared to classical computer. And over the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, uh, there are several uh, algorithms that have been discovered, but uh, not really too many. And quantum computers will have a plethora of applications starting from defense to finance. Even it can have application in chemistry or material design, material development, healthcare, software debugging, aerospace, transport, or over the last couple of years, now people are trying to imagine and apply in quantum machine learning, artificial intelligence, and many more things uh, you can you know you can think of. So if you Look at uh, the current views. Companies are trying to claim that they have achieved quantum supremacy. What is that? It is essentially the claim where your quantum computer can solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in any feasible amount of time. Whether you are able to do a useful task or uh, anything, but irrespective of that, if you can claim this, then you can you can say that yes, indeed, your uh, device or your machine has achieved quantum supremacy. And there is a similar thing you claim that it's quantum advantage. Essentially, you can claim that you can demonstrate that your quantum computer can solve the problem faster than classical computer. So all of you know that in 2019, Google claimed quantum supremacy with this processor with 54 number of qubit, and that could check random number generation in 200 seconds for a supercomputer can take about 10,000 years. And immediately in 2020, last year, December, the Chinese team, they designed another quantum processor, which is 10 billion times faster than Google's processor. And this, uh, and just to compare with classical supercomputer, if you want to do the same thing, it will take approximately 2.5 billion years to carry out that task. So you see that uh, you have something which can claim quantum supremacy. So what are the key challenges when you want to build quantum computer? So there are many, but I just highlight a few uh, important things. That is to be able to have a quantum algorithm to run on a quantum computer, you have to maintain the so-called quantum superposition. But any you know, interaction with the external world leads to uh, we lose this 
quantum coherence or quantum superposition, which is essentially the issue of decoherence. You have to fight with the decoherence. So you have to preserve uh, quantum coherence so that you can run your algorithm. And you have to be able to efficiently implement your data operations within that coherence time. Not only that, you have to be able to implement errors. So you should be able to do error corrections. And you should be able to scale up your procedure so that you can achieve something like thousand or million number of qubits compared to currently what is available. And, and ultimately, you should be able to aim for universal quantum computers. Uh, in addition to what I said, the information stored in quantum computer, they are very special. They, I mean, they have certain features which you don't see with classical information. So quantum information stored in a quantum computer, they maintain its privacy. So this was discovered by uh, in Zurich in 1982. That is, if you store information in a single qubit, nobody can make a copy. That means if you store information in quantum computer, only the person who has stored that information, only he or she can make a copy. Nobody else in the world can make a copy of that information. And in 2000, we discovered something called no deleting theorem that if you have two copies of a quantum bit, you cannot delete it. And then this Buryak and uh, this group, they discovered that you cannot design a not get, which is no flipping. And uh, in 2007, we discovered that if you store information in qubit, then you cannot hide it. That leads to conservation of quantum information. And very recently, we found that if you store information in qubit, you cannot store in bipartite correlation with the condition that locally with the each of the subsystem has no information. That means you cannot put mask in the local subsystem and keep the information only in the correlation. So that is not possible. So why I am telling this? Because these results will have deep implications the way we manipulate quantum computer. Because before you start playing with your device, you should know what is possible and what is not possible. So this is like setting the rules of the game before you start playing with the quantum computer. So what is the big picture? So big picture in this quantum information is the following, that one of the main goal uh, is how well we can store, process, and transfer vast amount of information contained in quantum state or qubit using principles of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanical features like superposition, entanglement, and non-classical features, they are exploited for practical applications and for doing imaging tasks which are impossible otherwise. So, so quantum information is uh, really you know quite vast, and quantum computing is one of you know part of this uh, you know the vast area of the uh, uh, quantum information. So there is also quantum communication, which comes uh, under this uh, uh, this discipline. That is how to send quantum information from Alice to Bob using rules of quantum theory and using different quantum and classical resources. When you say quantum resource, what I mean is that you have some shared entanglement, and then Ellis and Bob they can do something within remaining within quantum mechanics, and then they can communicate a classical channel, and in the end they will achieve the task. <laughs> so there are many things people have discovered over the last uh, 20 years, starting from quantum teleportation to super dense coding, remote state preparation, quantum secret sharing, quantum cryptography, quantum internet, quantum network, and many other things. So I'm not going to tell uh, uh, in detail. Uh, so in teleportation, essentially, what you want to do is you have a qubit, and you want to send this qubit without physical sending over this. And that you can do by sharing this entanglement and sending only two classical bits. And this is one of the most uh, beautiful, one of the most amazing uh, and uh, fundamental discovery that was made in Bennett by Bennett and others in 1993. And uh, just after six years, uh, I discovered this remote state Preparation where Alice has quantum bit or qubit in her mind, and she wants to create that quantum state at a distance location without physical sending the qubit. How can she do that? And, and uh, again, very surprisingly, if Alice and Bob they share this quantum entanglement, and by sending just one classical bit, she can create the quantum state or prepare the quantum state with, at a distance lab, and that is what this uh, protocol is. And quantum technology is really, uh, you know, as I said, uh, no, a lot of promise, and it has far-reaching innovation based on fundamental laws of nature. 
cutting from quantum computer to quantum software, quantum teleportation, and this uh, RSP, quantum network, quantum internet, QKD, and you can also imagine quantum imaging, quantum sensor, quantum metrology, and improved atomic clock, and quantum state interferography. This is something uh, very interesting. We discovered uh, along with uh, Professor Urbasi Sinha in RRI, and actually we did experiment. Uh, I mean, Urbasi Sinha group, they did experiment uh, in the lab. So essentially you can identify or infer state of a qubit using quantum interference. And this is very practical application because somebody, suppose somebody is having a company and he wants to sell a uh, you know, single photon source. And he claims that he is producing all the pure state, but suppose there is some error, something else he is, or he or she is applying, how do you ensure? And using this quantum state in the photography, you can, you can actually identify uh, whether the source is genuine or not. So this is a lot of application in quantum technology. And it will change nearly every aspect of future life. There's no doubt about that. So quantum technology, quantum computation is truly interdisciplinary because you need experts from quantum theory, you need from uh, computer science, you need from engineering, you need from information science, and communication, cryptography, and many more you know, uh, areas of uh, science. So what do you need? So we need uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, new insights, new innovations, because currently, Uh, essentially noisy internet scale quantum computer and these are available but what kind of useful tasks you can do on this NIST computer is not very clear. So we need to discover new quantum algorithms that can make use of this NIST computer more powerful, powerful, more efficient. For example, you need to find some clear application which can run in this NIST computer and you can actually do something useful. And in addition to that, we need to create and refine our language and compilation technique that give programmers the exclusive power to articulate the need of quantum computing implementation. And uh, real world application will involve hybrid system like classical and quantum computer, both. It is not that once you have a quantum computer, you will throw a classical computer because you need both the system. So how to program and map efficiently on such hybrid system is one of the uh, great challenge. And it is not clear what kind of physical system will really live in the race. So we need to explore new physical systems for future scalable quantum computers. So I have not touched upon this question, but others will uh, throw some light. But this is one of the great challenges. And uh, finally, we need uh, academic institute, private companies, and uh, like we should all collaborate to achieve our goal. So we need to bring quantum computing to commercial reality. So this will happen, and uh, we have to. Uh, what was that? So as I said in the beginning, quantum computing not only has the future, but can change the future. So stay tuned to witness the future quantum revolution. So thanks for your time. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Arun Kumar. Uh, uh, can I now request uh, Mr. George Nador, Director for Center of Quantum Technologies, uh, Department of Physics, National University of Singapore, to kindly address. Yes, could you activate my possibility yes, of I'm sharing? Just doing it. Yes, I'm just doing it. You can share your screen now. Can you see it? Yes, we can. That's perfect. Well, first, let me thank uh, the Asosham organization for this uh, opportunity to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in Singapore uh, on quantum technologies. So, uh, I would like to start just saying that uh, uh, I am uh, involved in the in creating the national uh, quantum strategy in Singapore, but I also, I come from Europe and uh, I know how the flagship is going. And I am so working for the Arab Emirates uh, to set up their strategy. So there are quite a number of uh, ideas which are shared in all these continents, in the three continents that I would like to share with you. So uh, the way the roadmap uh, in Singapore is being elaborated. And as I said, there are very many reminiscences of what's going on in other continents is the following. First, we are defining our mission. What are our scientific goals? Uh, 
and to define how we want to industry to collaborate with the scientists. Uh, for that, once we have defined the role, the mission, we are uh, defining actions, the specific actions for research, basic and applied research, for talent, development of uh, new scientists uh, that should be the future of the field, then how to relate to industry, innovation, how to relate to outreach. We think that outreach is absolutely relevant. There is a lot of hype. And uh, the best we can do is to have a very well informed society. Uh, internationalization is another leg that we are trying to set up uh, in full fledged. We think it's important. Singapore is a small country, so we have to relate to everybody. And there is another little action which is related to relate to venture building, how to create new companies, which is different from the innovation piece of the industry. And uh, for funding, uh, Singapore is really a good place because we do have uh, quite a number of different stakeholders. We do have uh, innovation agencies like the EDB. Uh, we have the Ministry of Education. We, we have the National Research Foundation. And we have programs, programs such as the Quantum Engineering Program. And one of the relevant uh, ideas about the Quantum Roadmap in Singapore is that one center, the Center for Quantum Technology, sh should be empower and uh, make uh, relevant. So this is an idea which is also similar to what you see in, uh, let me say, uh, Canada, Canada. You have IQC, Germany, Julik is getting promoted dramatically, in Spain, NIC4, uh, in Sweden, Chalmers. So uh, rather than having uh, a lot of investment uh, across the country, it's important to coordinate and to have a really pl a good place with a critical mass that can compete at international level. When I said before the ecosystem, I meant all these pieces. So we need to put together, align uh, basic research, applied research. We need to bring uh, innovation and enterprise. We need to bring the startup companies which are appearing. We have to set up uh, quantum facilities. I will mention them in the next minutes. And we have also to bring uh, the funding agencies. So in this particular case, the quantum engineering program and venture capital. Everything has to be aligned. Uh, CQT, just for you to know, is the center of excellence for quantum technologies in Singapore. We are around 200 scientists with 24 research investigators. That means that we have around 50 research, powerful research lines. We are now uh, educating 65 PhD students. Our expenditure is of the order of 24 million. We have created five uh, spin ups and uh, startups. Uh, when I mentioned before that we need alignment, this is exactly the transparency that shows that. So in Singapore, we're trying that the funding agencies, every research center, and the Center for Quantum Technologies share the same view of what quantum technologies are. And therefore, the funding agencies are aligned with this idea. So everything should come together. And uh, we think that uh, there are three big pillars. This is quantum communication and security, quantum computation and simulation, quantum sensing and metrology. Those are equivalent to the European uh, flagship uh, verticals. Uh, we have a common uh, horizontal with a flagship in Europe, which is basic science, but we have added in Singapore the necessity of having uh, research on advanced instruments. So we do think that a lot of the uh, first transfer of technology to society is not the really the very final product like a quantum computer, but probably uh, fast electronics or fridges or all the instruments which are necessary to develop advanced technologies. At CQT in particular, let me focus on the three verticals for quantum communication and security. We have developed satellites. Uh, we were the second country to put satellites in orbit with entangled 
pairs. Uh, this is uh, a project that now is growing to include other countries for the tracking stations. And we are also trying to make the island uh, quantum uh, ready. So we want all the relevant uh, communications in Singapore to be encrypted uh, with quantum mechanics. For that particular, the quantum national quantum safe network. So this is one of the national projects that they are being funded now at this moment. So we will connect every relevant piece of the island with the quantum technology. We also have uh, sensing, and let me mention two of them. We have uh, optical clocks, one of the best clocks in the planet. It's a precision of one part in 10 to the 17, it's one second in the age of the universe. They are based on lutetium. They are based on ion, uh, one ion. And we are now moving to have a multi-ion clock to enhance the position one order of magnitude to 10 to the 18. And we also produce gravimeters and magnetometers, actually at the level that they are one of the spin-offs that we have just to detect um, caves uh, on the, you know, for the, and they are users on the mining sector, they are users for, for science, there are plenty of uses for that. And finally, uh, we talked about quantum computation and simulation. And here, there are two things. One thing is uh, research, and this is the transparency for research. We have to explore quantum uh, technologies for qubits. Here, we have all of them. On the right, you have uh, superconducting currents. On the left, you have ion traps. We also have uh, Rydberg atoms. Uh, and we also have photonic chips. So we are dealing with four different technologies for qubits. And in particular, you here see our chip of 10 qubits, which is now, it is a real chip, uh, chip as you see, and it is now being benchmarked. Now, we also have uh, another national facility, which is a national quantum fabless foundry. It will become a quantum foundry simply without fabless. And the idea is that uh, you need to design, uh, you know, elements uh, for your research, and then they need to be fabricated in the clean rooms, and they have to be characterized and controlled. So the basic idea is that we will centralize a place to do all that. So we will have design support and characterization support, whereas the clean rooms in the island will do the fabrication. This will be a service for all our researchers. So this will take uh, the burden for the researchers to do all these pieces. They can concentrate on, on the real thing, on the research. And finally, uh, we have a proposal now for quantum computing hub. It's a national quantum computing hub. And the basic idea here is the following. Anything you, it is research, it is blue in my transparency, it is done at the universities or at the Center for Quantum Technology. But then there are other things which are not related to producing a paper. They are not, a publication is not the figure of merit. So for that, we are developing a hub that will cover that need. In particular, we will have a uh, production quantum computer sitting at the National Supercomputing Center. That's the idea uh, that production service to the community is done from the supercomputing center, not from the research labs. Uh, this will provide access to education, all the stakeholders, private companies, researchers. And then we will have algorithms, essentially applied algorithms within the hub. We want to work explicitly on the verticals of the sectors of the economy. We want to work on the supply chain, on chemistry, but then no need for a paper. It's, uh, it's a proactive action that we're taking. And the hub will also have a uh, lack in talent. We want to have certifications and macro credentials to bring all the people who are not physicists, but they are talented, so they can produce a real advance for quantum computation. On top of that, the quantum hub will have outreach relation to industry and international collaborations. And all these things are on the, they are being done now. So let me just uh, share with you a picture which I think is relevant, which is 
that I see myself uh, research centers, the place where we produce progress, scientific progress, but not the place where we serve the community. So this has to be done at these facilities, like the one we are setting here at the National Supercomputing Center. I must have been related to another initiative, which is very similar in, in Barcelona. And uh, there, again, the quantum computer will be at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. That facility is shared with all the software engineers that we are trying to train from the talent leg. And as you see in, in that uh, path, you need spin-offs company. It is not the task of the researcher to create a quantum computer that goes into the supercomputing center. For that, you need companies, spin-off companies from the research center. So let me be precise. The intellectual property is generated at the universities. It is transferred to the spin-offs or startups, and it is a startup that creates a product which is sitting in the facility. This is the scheme we want to pursue. And uh, indeed, in Europe, uh, it's not only accepted, but now the new plan for the end of the year, for November, there will be money for quantum computers, but they have to be bought from um, European companies. So they want to promote the creation of spin offs and startups. So at the heart of quantum computation, we should uh, realize that uh, we have the technological sovereignty of the countries. Uh, the countries will need to develop their own solutions as we are doing here in Singapore. Uh, so far, uh, the center has created five spin offs. And uh, here we have uh, two which are related to quantum communication and security. These are instruments S15 and a spectral is for the spectral is the spin off related to satellites. Uh, S15 is related to random number generators and single photon detectors. As you see, there are spin offs of the lack of quantum communication security. We have Entropic Labs and Horizon. There are two software companies, Tropical Labs for applications, horizon for the long-term structure of the middleware of a quantum computer. And finally, uh, Atomtronics, which is related to the, uh, Atomionics, sorry, to sensors for gravity. I should also mention, let me go back one step, that we do believe uh, that this uh, transfer of IP between processors and facilities needs another layer, which is the middleware. And within the hop, now we are adding a vertical, which is how to do a disconnection. So the stack of programming. And for that, uh, we are opting for an open source solution. We are embracing an open source solution called Kibo, which uh, is being developed uh, by collaborators in, again, in three different continents. We are proceeding in a very modest way because we know our powerful friends in the States, uh, in China, they have their own solutions, but we cannot rely on that. We have to run our 10 qubits, and for that we need uh, you know, to go down how to uh, handle the, the scheduler of the machine, how you do the calibration, how you run absolutely every pulse which is sent to the qubit. And for that, you need to develop the full stack, and that's another of the legs. So Kibo now is controlling the first processors we have, it will control the 10 qubit processor. It will now control also the ion trap processors that we are making in Singapore. Uh, and uh, this is everything I wanted to tell you. Uh, if you want further information about the funding opportunities, uh, how they are structured, it's a very interesting chapter uh, for our strategy. This is the quantum engineering program. For the structure of the center and directed, this is the security, quantum law is the place. And for the self-organized set of people that uh, trusted uh, quantum uh, a few years ago, uh, this is the quantum Singapore.org organization. So thank you very much for your attention. Cannot hear you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lato. Uh, can I request now Dr. Nagin Nagaraj, CEO and co-founder of UPI, 
to kindly make his address. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Varun. Uh, can you please make me a presenter. Yes, yes, I'm just sharing the rights. Thank you. You can share your screen now. Yep. Okay. So thank you, thank you Sachin, for this uh, great opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Kipai Technology. So uh, Kipai Technology on the paper is one of the the biggest conglomerate uh, quantum conglomerate in the world today. Okay. So just to introduce a group. Uh, so the mission of the group is to serve humanity with uh, advanced technology, and uh, there is nothing more advanced than quantum. And uh, uh, we have uh, been working in various fields, uh, uh, including AI as related to quantum, cloud as related to quantum, and superconducting materials, and as well as the batteries. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we have today in the company is like uh, uh, it's uh, it's a holding company uh, Q for uh, quantum and Pi for human ingenuity and we have four subsidiaries all of them are having a great traction and uh, we have a product coming out uh, uh, this year and early next year so to introduce the companies what we have uh, there was a talk saying that technology hunts in pair and these are the pairs what we have uh, Qpi AI is a quantum paired with AI where we are changing the very premise of AI processing and uh, the way the AI is modeled and Qpi Cloud is the uh, world's first uh, collaborative cloud computing based on uh, quantum and AI. And Superquantum is a superconductivity research company. We have two products, single photon detector and superconducting photos, and both will be out uh, early next year. And Qpi Volta is the first company to announce uh, quantum batteries and uh, solid state battery based on um, quantum and AI simulations. So just to introduce briefly about the companies, so these are the news. Uh, we are uh, uh, actually uh, been very active in the quantum world, and we announced uh, products uh, which are coming out of these companies. And to introduce uh, Qpi AI, uh, Qpi AI is uh, uh, consists of two main products: uh, AI uh, platform, uh, which is already deployed in uh, very big customers, uh, Fortune 500 clients, and the quantum computing chip. So what we have in the software is a huge amount of platforms. Uh, uh, starting from the education platform to logistics to quantum platform to AI platform, and then we have our own marketplace uh, which will be announcing uh, early next month. Uh, it's the world's biggest uh, AI and quantum marketplace, and we also joined with IAC to certify um, quantum expertise uh, across the world, and we are the first one to actually launch the certificate and then followed by IBM, and uh, this certification is uh, very much important to enter the marketplace. So we are creating sort of an ecosystem which is a very, which is very high quality uh, based on a very cutting edge product. And uh, we have around uh, four chip solutions. Uh, the first one is uh, Trion, which is a classical optimizer chip. It's quantum inspired plus classical optimizer chip. And Mumblebee is a 128 qubit control chip, which is taped out um, in the next three months. And we have Optimize, Optimal, Optimus Prime, which is a quantum processor, which is starting with 10 qubits this year. This year it will be tapered with 10 qubits. And early next year, we are thinking of scaling it to 128 qubits. And this is about Qpi AI. To just tell you like what we are working, we are working on CMOS, CMOS quantum dots, unlike uh, semiconductors, uh, we are uh, completely into CMOS. And as you see, like single electron transistors are core of all these things. And um, uh, we are working on the breakthrough here, uh, combining this physical qubits into logical, this is a very, very, very tough uh, task to do because uh, we need to work with gate fidelities, process variation, and we need to have a very fine control over uh, SETs and uh, electrons in there and the readout as well. So we do expect this technology to actually stabilize in two years. Uh, the first one, first prototype will be out this year in another three months, and uh, we are expecting around 10 qubits. Uh, each one is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 10 qubits which are entangled. Okay. Uh, to tell such so a solution, we are a full stack company. We have complete hardware, software, and even the protocol stack uh, to actually start developing an application. We have three chip solution. Uh, one is Trion, which is a universal optimizer chip, which which does all kind of optimization, which will be 10 to 20 x faster than GPUs, and it has a quantum inspired optimization as well. So this is the first product uh, where we'll be using in a lot of smart cities, uh, traffic handling, and you know, logistics and supply chain management and even manufacturing. And the second chip is the control chip, uh, which controls the quantum dots. And uh, the third one is the quantum dot itself. Okay. And uh, all these things constitute a full quantum solution that will be out in a year or two. 
right in the, ha in the hands of our customers. And the first ship will be out uh, this year itself, which is already getting deployed. Um, to suggest you that uh, the, the beauty of this product is that uh, when the customer gets the first ship, the classical ship, that's all they need to do. The software developed on that will be automatically be working on the quantum processor. Uh, that means that we just need to plug in the quantum darts and they are all quantum. Okay, So that's the beauty of this uh, solution. And uh, uh, we are actually having a long roadmap to improve the qubits and the quantum volume and then uh, eventually actually obtain uh, you know, industrial grade uh, uh, solution for this. The advantage why we went for uh, CMOS versus superconductor or photonic or ion traps. Uh, CMOS is tough. Of course, we know that CMOS is tough because uh, gate fidelity is a bigger issue. But then look into the scaling. If I want to put, assume just uh, hypothetically, I want to put a billion qubit. In superconducting technology, it's one kilometer square. Okay, so in semiconductor, it is one centimeter square. And other is uh, you have, I can have a very compact for your pre coolers because we are targeting sooner or later, we are targeting it around 4K, not 20 millikelvin. And once we achieve that and we achieve a good quantum volume, I think this can be scaled to a million qubits very easily compared to other technologies. Okay, so that's the reason we choose uh, 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 the semiconductor qubits and uh, we have made a lot of strides there. We have our own patented technology about how to make the qubit and um, we're relying on, um, you know, a very custom technology here to actually come out with the qubit. And uh, we'll hear a lot of these things um, in coming months. Some of the applications, uh, yeah, I think a lot of speakers have already told all these things, uh, but I'll just reiterate quantum application. Quantum has a huge application in logistics, energy, and manufacturing. Uh, I will uh, also suggest some of the application POC we are doing right now with these things. And uh, these will follow us with quantum inspired solution or Trion chip. And uh, most of them are getting deployed uh, this year as a POC and early next year with the production. And then uh, we have chemical, petroleum, and uh, petrochemicals. Okay, so these are again a very important application for uh, our solution. Okay, so we follow the same road. First, we deploy the, the quantum inspired solution, and as when as and when we reach the critical uh, qubit count, uh, we just need to our customer just need to upgrade the qubits, and they are all quantum, and they get around like. Thousand X speed up. Okay. We have finance. Finance is very, very important for us. Uh, it's not only quantum processor, but also something like QRNG, quantum security, and then uh, you know quantum network that matters here. And uh, our second company, which is Kupai Cloud, uh, is looking into uh, quantum security and you know quantum network. Uh, and the second company, what we have is uh, second uh, subsidiary is Kupai Cloud. Kupai Cloud is uh, world's first collaborative. It's our patented technology where uh, we enable collaboration on the cloud, which is lacking today in major public clouds. Um, public clouds are meant for individual usage, and uh, the real pain point there is actually, you know, having the workflows uh, automation across uh, vendor, customer, and partners. And uh, we have built our own patented technology based on quantum and AI engine, where this workflow can be automated. Very nicely, and uh, one of the special case of our collaborative platform is uh, Qpi DSD, which is uh, Qpi Digital Health Data Exchange, which enable collaboration on the drug discovery and uh, healthcare data for the smart cities. Okay, and again, it's based on a quantum network, and uh, we are deploying our own data centers. Plan is to build our own data centers, maybe world's biggest quantum data center, and uh, enable all this uh, research collaboration on Qpi Cloud. The third one is SuperQ, which is incubated in the Sense Lab ISC. We are working on uh, superconductor device technology, and where we are actually having a flow for actually uh, simulating the superconductivity at uh, high temperature first, and then eventually uh, we will see like high temperature, room temperature, and uh, room pressure. That is a far-fetched thing; it may take another five years. But what we're trying to do is uh, come up with the products. Okay, the two important products what we have today is a single photon detector, a single photon superconductivity nano wire based single photon detector, which will be out in another six months, and then uh, superconductivity motors. So this is a groundbreaking research what we are doing, and all these are modeled using AI and quantum. Okay, so we are actually modeling the entire of this uh, product using uh, our uh, simulation setup, uh, which is shown on the left hand side, and uh, this is something. Uh, there are a lot of customers waiting for a single photon detector because that is a basic building block of quantum network. 
fourth one and the most, the biggest one of all things is uh, Kipai Volta. Kipai Volta is uh, a battery company which is uh, making the solid state batteries or the quantum batteries uh, 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 based on our, uh, uh, again, the material discovery driven by quantum simulations. And uh, this is again uh, something of a, a very important, uh, you know, uh, the research and the product, uh, disruptive product, what we are coming up with. Even the solid state battery, what uh, will be out by next year, uh, where we have some new material discovered and it will be out next year, is based on uh, uh, something related to quantum. And the quantum battery is fully quantum, where we are actually using some kind of a quantum source to model the battery. It doesn't take a long time, this will take at least another three or four years. But the thing is, we have made some grounds there and we have some results. And then the first production version will be solid state battery, again, driven by quantum simulation, which is shown on the left hand side, which is much more. Uh, bigger, but I just, uh, you know, minimized uh, and show the simplified version of a quantum simulation for designing the quantum batteries. And uh, just to show some of the POC work um, on the smart cities, uh, we are combining all these technologies to make enable our smart cities, um, both in India and abroad. There are two other major countries where we're trying to apply this technology and to come up with a smart city solution. The POC will be like uh, next. Uh, Six months to one year, we are going to actually have some POCs working, and some of the POCs are uh, this uh, smart city security, traffic management, smart city planning, uh, smart city healthcare infrastructure, and smart street using the smart batteries. So this is the way we are trying to construct. This is a basic, uh, uh, you know, the way we can actually enhance the security in the smart city. Okay, based on quantum uh, secure Kipai Cloud. Kipai Cloud is center of all, all these things, and. Uh, we have come up with a scheme where uh, we can have a secure quantum key exchange. Okay, again, the basic building block here is uh, a single photon detector and the quantum uh, this uh, photon source, and then uh, we are actually trying to demo the entire quantum network at least in a smaller scale, and then uh, we go for some kind of a POC in uh, uh, in one of the smart cities, bigger one either in India, which is maybe Hyderabad or maybe like in UAE or Japan or something like that. And this is what will be the first POC to show that quantum network and quantum processing uh, can enable really a great smart city and a very secure smart city. And this is the biggest among the, all the applications what we have for, uh, you know, from our Qpi cloud. Uh, this is called uh, Digital Health Data Exchange, uh, Qpi Digital Health data, data Exchange. So what we're trying to do is uh, with the minimal amount of data and without loss of security, that means uh, we comply to a lot of HIPAA standard and uh, there will be no loss of privacy and other things, but still enable the, uh, you know, uh, collaboration on the cloud to enable the, uh, you know, uh, the research diagnostics and rapid response to something like pandemic possible using uh, this platform. Where uh, we're trying to bring, see that there are research on healthcare and uh, sincerely, uh, this is my opinion, personal opinion, but it's not been very successful. Uh, most of the healthcare research uh, really lagging the need. And what we think is like, if the research is collaborative, maybe that can be accelerated. And that's the aim for, um, you know, Qpi DSD, uh, which is uh, enabling not only the data, but intelligence exchange among the players. And uh, that should be the, the rapid uh, progress in um, diagnostics, drug discovery, and even like preventive healthcare, personalized medicine, a lot of these things. And this is one of this cloud, which is almost ready, and uh, we should be able to demonstrate by uh, Q1 of next year or end of this year. And the smart city traffic management, this solution is already proven with one of the big customers, and we have shown that uh, there is a 60% reduction in the traffic, uh, you know, route travel, the cost reduction. Okay, it's like if there is a $1 billion logistic cost, we save around 600 million. And this is possible because of a quantum inspired solution, what we have today. And uh, the same thing can be applied for traffic flow optimization for smart city. Not only vehicle road optimization, but also traffic flow optimization can decongest the smart city in the longer way. And uh, building a smart city is not easy. It's an optimization problem. And uh, you have multiple variable to optimize here. And that can be enabled again by Occupy Cloud, uh, where uh, we can have different players who are constructing the smart city come on this and then, you know, uh, they can all uh, get involved in this uh, building of smart city over the cloud, our cloud service, and that should enable really optimal and uh, uh, you know uh, very well planned smart city. We have a complete software stack here, and uh, and uh, you know we also are working for a POC to demonstrate that this can really provide uh, great results when they are built on quantum inspired solution and quantum solution, rather than just uh, you know the classical one and you know. Um, and not really organized uh, software one. 
So this is uh, again uh, quantum. This is a battery related thing. Uh, one of the problem we face is like energy in the smart cities, and uh, we are solving with two uh, two step solution. One is uh, providing the grid batteries uh, for the smart city, which is based on uh, high temperature superconductor. Okay, which is a which can hold the charges for a long time. Okay, and it has a very high capacity. Uh, and then uh, we have a solid state battery for the consumers. Uh, this should enable the energy flow both the ways. With these two batteries, uh, I think current what we're trying to do today is uh, we are we are approaching one of the cities where uh, we just install these batteries and grid and uh, as well as a, a consumer place and show that the energy distribution is both the ways. If there is excess energy uh, produced at the endpoint, that is homes and uh, factories that can be produced to grid. And when the high energy demand, it can be given back to the customer. Okay. So this is again based on a very, very advanced battery technology based on superconductors and uh, as well as a solid state battery. These are the things, some of the things allow reward by quantum. Okay, without having a quantum simulation setup, synthesis setup, and even in manufacturing, all these batteries are not even possible today. Okay, so our initial simulation shows that these are possible, and we are going to take it to production as soon as possible, and possibly a, a battery battery factory in Bangalore and maybe in Texas, uh, these two places. Yeah, so this is our team, very accomplished team. Okay, so we have both from academia. Uh, Professor Rokan Bhad, Aturathri, Professor Ujwal from HRI and Shushankar, and very accomplished PhDs who are working for us. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nagin Nagaraj. Now, sure. can I request our session moderator, Sri Devrup Dhar, uh, co founder and managing director of MS Partners, to please uh, carry the uh, session moderation? Over to you, Mr. Devrup Dhar. Thanks, uh, Varun and all the panelists and the speaker. It was really uh, uh, quite uh, enlightening to listen to uh, the talk so far. So, so uh, I would like to welcome uh, all the distinguished panel members guests and audience members to the session on uh, digital infrastructure and quantum technologies in India, how India can prepare itself in becoming quantum ready for the future. So, as uh, we all know that quantum technology is an extremely promising segment. It's a, it's a segment which has huge potential. Uh, the global market is expected to grow and cross 21 billion USD over the next five years. Or so. so, with US, uh, in India, we have seen government of India stepping in with uh, honorable finance minister uh, launching the national mission on quantum technologies and applications as part of the budget uh, in 2020 with a uh, outlay of uh, about 8,000 crore over a period of five years. Uh, we have seen uh, with government stepping in uh, with the uh, academic uh, institutions, research institutions stepping in and with a large amount of private sector participation and startups coming in. I think the quantum technology segment in India is definitely uh, at a stage uh, wherein uh, we are looking at a large number of uh, commercial applications going out, uh, huge growth potential. And it's a very interesting point uh, of time. With this background, let me invite uh, our first guest uh, of the session, Dr. B.K. Murthy, uh, who is a senior director, scientist, G, and a group coordinator in R&D uh, and IT, R&D in IT and NKN in the Ministry of Electronics and IT Government of India. As part of his role, he is responsible for promotion of R&D in the area of IT and implementation of Vishveshwarya PhD Fellowship Scheme in the National Knowledge Network, Digital India, Infoway, uh, CDAC, and NELIT. Prior to this, he was uh, in charge of uh, CDAC NOIDA Center as an executive director. He holds a PhD degree from IIT Delhi. So, over to you, Dr. Murthy. Uh, yeah your address on this uh, very interesting subject. 
good afternoon uh, am i audible yes you are yeah okay fine uh, let me share the screen uh, already we are late by half an hour i suppose so let me... yes we are running running about yeah, uh, are... 20 odd minutes late yes yes so yeah thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and uh, i would be talking about some of the major initiatives in the country from the, especially the government initiatives uh, are able to yeah uh, so i'll be talking about india quantum technology conclave in this uh, conclave quantum computing initiatives by mit especially i will be talking but uh, majorly i will co cover other initiatives as well so quantum technologies you are, you are aware that it will become a game changer especially in the strategy area strategic area and data security and uh, communication these are the three major areas computing and communication and security and cryptography these are the areas will largely be affected with the quantum technologies so as the technology is very nascent and everybody is trying to uh, capture it and then try to find out and most of the people are not ready to give the transfer of technology to any industry at this point because there are a lot of r and d going on and people are trying to hold the ip for getting a good value of ip so importing and purchasing of this technology is very difficult for us and we need to have our own capacity and capabilities need to be developed in india so hence we need to have a significant effort coordinated effort by all uh, stakeholders especially the academia and the research labs and uh, the other higher educational institutions and industry also should come forward so that is the major goal if you see the worldwide the spending in the quantum technologies almost all major developing or developed countries are investing, are investing huge and uh, you especially us canada and then europe most of the countries are uh, already putting in a lot of money and india also we are uh, trying to uh, create a uh, cohort of uh, good quantum computing people and the research activities that we want to develop so what are the major initiatives as you have rightly mentioned that last year in the budget speech it was announced that national mission on quantum technologies will be uh, will be developed and then i thousand crores has been earmarked for that and under the pm stack program then bst and mit and drdo and isro these are the major government organizations who are participating in this whole, whole program and dst is peer heading this and you might have heard from uh, professor ashok sharma's uh, speech about this bst's program of national quantum on quantum technologies and application program but i will be just briefly talking about what are the major initiatives that are being taken and this quantum technologies as you are aware that it is highly interdisciplinary and cutting edge technologies so it involves physicists and quantum mechanics people electronics and computer science and electronic instrumentation people and materials people all these people put together it is a completely interdisciplinary program so all the researchers if they are working in silos it will be become a lead if we may not be able to converge into a mega project so the main idea of this program is to combine all these initiatives into one major initiative and then show that india's capability in the band quantum technology so while uh, we are working on the mulling over the dpr and then finalizing the program for this 8000 crore project so uh, simultaneously small efforts are also have been started and dst has last year announced the quest program and dst under the interdisciplinary cyber physical systems program also they have set up a technology innovation hub at iser mohali and iser pune uh, there is a typo here iser pune and then iser mohali so mit also has started a center of excellence in quantum technologies along with iis bangalore and rri and cdac so iis bangalore basically develops Development of the quantum technologies as uh, started with the elementary building of quantum uh, computer processor, which is eight bit qubit process, eight qubit uh, processor, and quantum computing and quantum communication and electronic instrumentation and other interfaces will be done by CDAC, and RRI especially Professor Urvashi Sena is here. She will be talking more on these activities. 
they are developing on the quantum tele teleportation over uh, optical fiber link up to 100 kilometers or beyond that and qkd protocols and post quantum cryptography are also working along with sets and uh, iit madras so drdo and strategic uh, secured communication basic they are working they are working on quantum materials and quantum dots and quantum clock and some of these activities they are already working on quantum and secured communication network that is a major for strategic importance drdo is focusing on and isro mainly quantum communication for satellite communication through satellite link so isro is focusing on that so these are some of the major government initiatives as part of these uh, quantum technologies, we have started quantum building our own quantum simulator. So indige indigenous quantum computing simulator, it is first, of course, you most of you are aware that IBM has announced that QSKIT quantum simulator and ATOS and CDAC has developed another quantum simulator and the AWS also has come out with some quantum simulator. So the skill development in the quantum computing simulator, IASC Bangalore has developed the quantum simulator, basic simulator, and CDAC Bangalore has developed its user interface and other uh, software for that. And CDAC Hyderabad porting onto Param supercomputer and IIT Roorkee, we combined them into development of quantum computing course and then capacity building and doing some experiments for the students and researchers to learn on that basically. So this quantum computer simulator is the first um, first initiative in India. It addresses both the challenges and advanced quantum computing, and also it focuses on the uh, decoherence devices and the uh, devices which are uh, I mean, collapsing devices also, faulty devices also it can simulate. That is the major advantage of this. It is not just ideal case it will present, like any other simulator, it will give the faulty devices also so that the people, students can do a lot of experiments on this. So it, it offers a robust QS quantum computer simulator integrated with various work friends. The UI is there. Students and researchers can use it definitely. And imprecise initial state preparation also you can start with and you can create some noise and along with the gates and disturbances in the data and memory also you can create so these are these are the advantages of this quantum simulator. Multiple users submit simultaneously is on the cloud base, the cloud uh, you can access and solved examples, some of practical examples, and some of are designed along with that. It can have a run um, standalone system on the Param Havoc machine uh, on this. And also Q QM simulator is available and the high performance computing system of uh, Param Siddhi, that AI machine developed by under NSM program. So the roles of participating in institutions, IASA Bangalore has designed the basic uh, quantum toolkit and the idea behind the whole thing. And CDAC Bangalore has developed the user interface and CDAC Hyderabad has uh, attempted porting onto power computing, paralyzing the whole effort. And IIT Rurki designed some R&D and the quantum security algorithms and then developed the Jupyter Network for various students and researchers to use it and also designed some of the experiments and ran a lot of courses. Nearly around 500 students and researchers have been trained so far under various programs. So this is one of the interface screen. You can get the interface and interactive user interface with Jay having this uh, quantum simulator toolkit that is indigenously, indigenously developed it. And it is now ported onto Param Shavak machine and the supercomputer facility. And also it has an, and it can work on the cloud using cloud Param Siddhi computer and many users can work. So in addition to that capacity building cryptography programs are also we have started online courses have been started. IIT Roorkee and QU Labs, Professor Nixon, Nixon Patel, Dr. Nixon Patel is there. And CDAC and DOTOS has created another machine, uh, quantum simulator. And IIT Roorkee and IASC Bangalore, which already I have showed it. And MIT and COE and IASC and uh, this RRI and then CDAC combined with one center of excellence has been set up. DST has already mentioned about the technology incubation hub has been created in ISAP Pune and Mohali. And in addition to that, AWS has set up a quantum uh, center of excellence in quantum computer in the IC Digital India Corporation in MIT. 
and these they are offering this uh, at least uh, one lakh uh, hours of uh, quantum computing machine uh, that simulator and the parallel processing machine to the various students and researchers for over a period of three years and it will be operational very soon and another important thing that is from this academic year onwards iisc bangalore has started this mtech in quantum technologies and application quantum computing and quantum technology science has has started this program this is a regular mtech program from iisc bangalore will be from this academic year onwards already the admission uh, progress uh, is in progress in addition to that, we are trying to do a small project on uh, quantum digital signature, post quantum digital signature, how the digital signatures can vary with the quantum technologies once these are available, quantum computer is available. That is another major activity that we are doing it. And quantum network segment, how we can get a quantum network, a secured network on NKN. So IIT Madras and SETS Chennai and NIC we have taken one segment from Bangalore to Delhi, one complete segment of uh, NKN segment on which how this quantum, it can be a secured quantum uh, network can be constructed for uh, strategic applications of NKN. Uh, that what we have another project that we have started very recently. So these are some of the major initiatives that are going on across the country in various government departments. In addition to that, many people are uh, trying to work out various uh, projects along with the industry and also with uh, uh, the academia and research labs. And especially the QU labs, so Nixon Patel has set up three centers of excellences uh, apart from this, one in Calcutta and one in uh, Hyderabad, IIT Hyderabad and also in one in IIT Roorkee. So especially for the capacity building and then doing research in AI and quantum technology. So some of these major initiatives and I'm aware that there are uh, a few startup companies have already started. I mean, it has reached the second double digit already. And there are more than 10 or 15, uh, uh, then, uh, I mean, startup companies are already there and working in it. And I, I'm very sure that India's quantum computing machine will uh, kick off very fast. And then within the next uh, three or four years, we are also compatible with other uh, countries of developing countries in this area. We are not behind. We are not lying behind in this area of quantum technologies when compared to any other country in this world. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, thank you, sir, for this uh, very insightful uh, presentation on the initiatives taken by of India along with its uh, academic and research partners. With this, uh, I would like to welcome the next uh, speaker of the day, uh, Sri Animesh Sharyan, founder and CEO of TechBit Labs for uh, his initial insights into the subject. Also, I would request, uh, since we are running short of time, if we can uh, have uh, uh, the initial uh, uh, insights, etc., of our around uh, three four minutes. Sure. Over to thank you, Mr. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Devdu. Uh, dear esteemed panelists, namaste to one and all. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this conclave, and this is Animesh uh, presenting Tagbit Labs, which was which is a company founded in the year two thousand eighteen, and our primary objective is to commercialize uh, quantum technologies in India. And we are actively engaged with uh, government organization and uh, enterprises towards the effective adoption of uh, you know secure quantum communication system to start with. And uh, I must say that you know the session was session of the the previous speakers have been uh, very intuitive uh, you know in terms of presenting their uh, data, especially the one on uh, from Singapore. Uh, I feel that, you know, um, that uh, ASOCHAM has done a great job and I would like to congratulate the organizers for building, uh, you know, this kind of a platform where people from government, academia and industry can come on a single platform. So I believe that this forum will strengthen the industry academia collaboration and we can take this uh, uh, technology ahead and make country self-reliant. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. So, uh, 
Mr. Arin, uh, do you have any presentation or uh, uh, we'll come back to the questions uh, at a later point of time? Yeah, we'll we'll uh, actually we'll come back to the questions. That's where we're prepared. Sure. For. Thanks, thanks, uh, Mr. Arian, for your uh, initial comments. Uh, with this, uh, we would move on to the next uh, uh, guest for the day, Sri Abhishek Chopra, founder and CEO of Boston Club PSI, for his uh, thoughts and point of view on the subject. Over to you, Mr. Chopra. Thank you, Mr. The honorable dignitaries. Uh, again, I really appreciate uh, this, this this whole event that is put by Asochan and uh, the dignitaries present uh, the thought that were presented as a youth of India. Um, I really strongly believe in this technology and a uh, lot of things have, have to be achieved. It's a long one, as uh, mentioned previously. So, Mr. If I can request, uh, uh, if I can share my screen. Make it quick. Yes, just give me a moment. You can share your screen now. So I'm the founder and CEO of Boson QSI. Uh, Boson QSI is an early stage startup uh, which was formed in 2020, um, September of 2020, in, in the midst of a pandemic where uncertainty prevailed. And then we, we believed as, as youngsters that if this time of uncertainty can be utilized uh, in, in, in realizing our dreams. So Boson QSI uh, comes in, in a very different uh, fashion. It brings quantum paradigm into multiphysics simulations, financial simulations, or simulations in general. We come from an application perspective. So we are the first mover in quantum computing for engineering simulation, which is extending to financial uh, simulation. So we are a B2B uh, technology uh, offered through SaaS platform. Very quickly, uh, we, are, we are targeting uh, higher accuracy and lower turnaround times, which are needed in very much uh, a lot of industries. Uh, for example, automotive, uh, then you have aerospace, uh, energy, construction, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, consumer goods, and electric. So we are really targeting a very big pool of market and the companies. Uh, and, and why PQP is necessary in this is because a lot of industries need high accuracy simulations. Uh, you can think from as high as like designing a building to as low as even designing a shampoo bottle. Everything does require some kind of simulation and testing, and this is where uh, high quality comes in. And what people have struggled, the companies have struggled, is is these these simulations are really not possible in a given amount of time. Uh, and, and here in the screen, you see some of the examples of what happens when you go for um, like quick simulations, and we, we are not able to do that. And that is where we come in. Our vision is to become the premier simulation software company, leveraging the power of quantum computing. Again, we come from an application perspective, so we know this industry, aerospace industry, automotive industry, financial industry very well, um, and the pain points there. And our mission is to become an integral technology in the product lifecycle of any such customer. And currently, we are designing uh, and developing a metaphysics simulation software that is based on hybrid GPU QPU approach to so the hybrid systems. Um, and then just to highlight, uh, we are a young startup, but we have done a very fabulous job in, in attracting uh, why we are, we, are, we are differentiating in this product and also within the, the quantum technology along with the government and other startups uh, here in India. And we are going global. We have a very strong team that is formed. So the founding team, all uh, of us um, are, are young, I would say, like we are 25 years of age, but very, very strong capability that we have built uh, over years. Um, and we are also joined with the uh, our advisory board um, and other things. So with, with that, I just would like to thank again for this opportunity. And both of this side is here to make a fundamental difference as our name reflects uh, boson, which is which is the particle that is named after the, the respected uh, scientist, which, which, is, which is of Indian origin. And that's where we, we understand the fundamental difference uh, in, in this quantum technology. So thank you. Um, and really excited to be here with these uh, amazing set of people. I've heard them about, I've heard great things about them. And this is the first time I'm getting the opportunity to sit with them and discuss the hotel as a youth of it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mr. Chopra. That was a good introduction about uh, the organization and how uh, 
such important simulation is in various industries and how quantum technology can help. With this, I'll uh, like to welcome our next guest, uh, Sri Nixon Pajel, a young professor, Department of Artificial Intelligence and Electrical Engineering at the Indian Institute of Technology, Hyderabad, and uh, CEO Q Labs and a serial entrepreneur. Uh, over to you, Mr. Patel, for your ideas and thoughts on the subject. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Dar, and thank you, Asikman, and the rest of the folks. Just want to do a quick um, a share of what we've been doing with Q Labs, which is uh, established, I think, in the earliest companies in India. If I can share the, can you just allow me to share the screen? Please? Varun, can you just help with the sharing, please? Already given, Nixon, you can share your screen. Yeah, yeah, this. Yeah, okay. I just got the. Can you see the screen now? Yes, we can see the screen. You can go ahead and start. Okay. So yeah, QLabs is based out of uh, Princeton, New Jersey, and as uh, Dr. Martin just uh, said, we have, have four labs in uh, various IITs, IIT Hyderabad, where I'm also at Prat and uh, in Kolkata. We are now moving to the IIT KGP uh, research park, where uh, IIT Kharagpur in my alma mater. We have one in IIT Roorkee, which is where we build that uh, simulator along with ISC and other folks. See that. So let me quickly. Uh, so we we want to uh, kind of build things in the quantum communication space. Right? Quantum computing has been kind of uh, been happening, and from Indian perspective, I think communication is the right, the sweet spot, which I think is uh, relevant. And so we are focusing on that. Um, but this side of it, skip. This is general communication. This is the market size. I think I so. Here we are, right? We are among the first global companies in quantum communication, and we are working with also ecosystem in Canada and in US and in UK. Uh, we are working with Princeton University in UK and and US with uh, University of Maryland, which is, I think, the highest number of quantum faculty in the world, and with uh, Chicago Quantum Exchange. So we try to accelerate quantum communication solutions based out of uh, these labs in India. It's multidisciplinary focused with uh, Global Institute Connex. And this comes from my previous seven or eight startups. Most of them I do with the uh, industry academia kind of uh, previous startup was an AI, which had eight labs in India, one in Israel, one in uh, US. And I was uh, 12 years ago, I did the first one of the first uh, solar startup in India. And for that, one of the first speech engine companies, so forth, right? So this is the same model. This is a time evolution with various products, uh, still time consuming. So I'll just focus on this. We are trying to create secure, long distance, scalable quantum internet. So at IIT Hyderabad, we have two or three groups. There are about uh, various faculties, uh, PhD scholars, postdocs, and a bunch of people, about 20 are in different uh, capacity. Uh, where we are building the next uh, quantum network simulator. Currently, three or four other institutes in the world, uh, the Delft or KO in Japan, a few in the US have built the first and the second layer of that network uh, stack, and we are building on top of that the network protocol stack. And we're uh, just about finished uh, creating the first quantum network routing protocol. Uh, so that's that. Then we have a federated machine learning group. That's another group. And the other part, the secure communication where we have in our groups in Kolkata, we're doing something called blind quantum computing, which allows a poor Alice with little or no quantum resource to be able to delegate its, its quantum algorithm or work to a Charlie, which has a lot of resources without, uh, you know, letting the Charlie know about his data or algorithm. Also, there's quantum secure direct communication protocols we are making, which are used for quantum dialogue, multi party. Uh, quantum kind of a, a conference, and with all these quantum network, uh, quantum internet, we need quantum memory. So that's another product in quantum memory. 
So these are some of the IP that are getting built. And idea is to start building a portfolio of uh, patents out of India, this area. Um, uh, this is a quantum value chain, communication value chain. We are playing in some of these areas. And uh, these are some of our stack, the quantum internet stack. Um, and this is the whole bunch of uh, quantum protocols, which are all unique and very novel, multi-party establishing of um, a group key for multiple users. And this stack talks about uh, AI. So what what what, uh, what we are trying with this whole thing is to scale with number of research institutes, number of scientists, and number of IP out of India. So that's the idea. And collaborate with this is myself and my co-partner Bill out of US. And, uh, we have some of these advisory people, partial advisory, most of the professors in various societies that we have had. So so that's 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 all I wanted to share. And um, I think I think I think it's exciting times for uh, us in the quantum space. And I think uh, there is there are at least I remember I was part of the IBM Quantum Global School last summer as a mentor, and there were about five thousand students. And what stood out is more than fifteen hundred students were from India, and that was really an eye opener. That there is a huge pent up demand for kids. So last year we had about forty students who went through internships at our various labs. This year we have almost 50 students, BTEC students, ISR, I, from ISSR and other uh, undergrads. So we're trying to build the ecosystem. Thank sure. Th thanks, uh, Mr. Patel. Uh, it was quite insightful. Uh, moving on to the uh, our next uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Umakant uh, D. Rapol, who is principal investigator an associate professor of atomic physics and quantum optics lab at Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research at Pune. So over to you, Dr. Rapul, for your thoughts on the subject. Yeah, thank you very much, Devru. And I'm excited to be on this forum to be discussing and telling about what's going on with respect to quantum technologies at ICER Pune. So I'll quickly share a few slides, not much. Uh, can I? Get the control to share the slides. Uh, Mr. Umakanji, you already have. You just need to share your screen. Uh, okay. Okay, I'm unable to. Can you do it so now? In case, in case you're facing any issues, maybe you can just uh, continue with your talk. Uh... Yeah, okay, fine. So, fine. So, I'm Umakant Rapol. I've been working with ICER Pune for the past uh, 11 years. But before, I've been involved in the area of quantum technologies for over uh, 16 years now. So, I've been working in uh, quantum computing since 2003. And before that, uh, I've been working with using ultra cold atoms and ions for various applications, including precision spectroscopy and other things. But quantum technologies has now emerged as the most, uh, I mean, promising technologies, which uh, actually uses some of these, uh, some of the known principles from controlling quantum systems from the past. Now, at ICER, I have been setting but setting up experiments to develop quantum clocks, quantum simulators, and quantum computers, and also quantum sensors. So I have a couple of experiments where we actually have uh, demonstrated uh, quantum gravimeter using ultra cold atoms, and also quantum simulators. Now, in addition to that, uh, we have a couple of big programs going on at ICER Pune. One of them is uh, uh, a part of the quantum enabled science and technology program initiated by the department of science and technology and we have two themes from the two themes we have a couple of programs running one of my colleagues works on uh, 
using nitrogen vacancy centers and nuclear magnetic resonance for quantum computing. And I am involved in using ultra-cold atoms in optical lattices for distributed quantum information processing and also quantum simulations. In Apart from that, recently, uh, DST has uh, supported funding, uh, supported the establishment of this technology innovation hub at ICER Pune, which has over 20 participating institutions from the country and many foreign collaborators. Now, the main uh, goals of this hub is going to be developing technologies from quantum, developing products from quantum technologies, which uh, on, in areas where the technology readiness levels are pretty high, and also concentrate on uh, ramping up those areas in within quantum technologies, which are at the lower technology readiness levels, apart from developing a lot of human resource and uh, skills development, which will feed into these areas of quantum technologies in India and develop everything that goes into quantum technologies to enable development of products in quantum technologies. So, yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Thank, thank, okay. Thanks, Dr. Rapol, for your initial views. Uh, now we will move on to the next uh, the guest for the day, uh, Professor Urvashi Senha. Uh, professor Senha is a professor of quantum information at computing lab at the light and matter physics group at Raman Research Institute. Over to you, uh, Professor Senha, for your thoughts uh, on the subject. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Yeah. yeah. So thank yeah. you very much, uh, Mr. Dhar. And, and of course, thank you to Asuchan for this opportunity to participate in this discussion. And of course, I'm looking forward to more in the next half an hour, 45 minutes. So I'll use the next three, four minutes to give you a little introduction to our lab and its work on quantum science and technologies. Uh, I personally have been associated with this field for more than two decades and uh, done solid state quantum devices and nanotechnology in my PhD in uh, Cavendish in the UK and in Cambridge. And then at IQC Canada, I did my postdoctoral work on quantum optics primarily. So, as was mentioned, we are I'm heading the quantum information and computing lab at RRI Bangalore, and we are working. And we are one of the first labs in the country to be working on single and entangled photons and their applications to myriad uh, quantum uh, science and technologies. And uh, we work on different domains, for instance, quantum correlations, quantum entanglement, as well as generalized quantum measurements and new ideas uh, uh, therein. Uh, one of our recent uh, results in this domain was uh, devising and experimentally demonstrating a novel quantum state estimation protocol, uh, which was actually alluded to by Professor Pati in his uh, presentation earlier. And so uh, this, he was his, our theory collaborator on this. So the work was, uh, you know, uh, published in the prestigious physical review letters. And it's in fact very amenable uh, to be taken up for uh, commercialization purposes through miniaturization devices. And it provides us with a tool to have a measurement on the one state uh, through interferometry. And this will, of course, have ramifications in computing, communications, and other areas. Um, like my other academic colleagues, I'm glad that the Indian government has been quite forthcoming in you know, enabling our quantum research through various uh, programs. Uh, we, our lab plays an important role through a project under the DST Quest program, which Professor Sharma talked about. And we are working on long distance quantum repeater and relay technologies in that. In fact, one of our thrust areas is indeed in the domain of secure quantum communications. And we are heading India's first project on satellite based quantum communication, which is a collaboration between RRI and ISRO. And it's called Quantum Experiments with Satellite Technology. And uh, we are very privileged to, to have received the support and funding back in 2017 when quantum was not quite as commonly used a word as it is now. Uh, through concerted effort over the last several years, our lab has demonstrated many important ground-based milestones. So we have published India's first free space QKD experiment, again in an internationally peer-reviewed forum, Physical Review Applied. This work, along with the quantum state interferography work that I talked about, was in fact chosen by DST as one of their top 20 innovations uh, in 2020. And our QKD work was in fact also chosen by India Science, the nation's science channel, as 2020's uh, top science contribution. 
So we have performed India's first experiment on quantum communication between two buildings using a free space atmospheric channel using entanglement as a resource. This is an important milestone towards increasing distances in communication culminating in satellite QKD. So we are glad that you know, our efforts have encouraged further efforts in, in the government agencies in, uh, in ISRO and others towards developing capacities in this uh, domain. Uh, there is the Center for Excellence in Quantum Technologies, which Dr. Mukti introduced, set up by MITI. Uh, and we are leading projects on a long distance quantum teleportation as well as device independent random number generation. We have other labs at RRI that are working on novel quantum sensing and quantum metrology approaches. Uh, we are also working on UKD for P QKD for people like you and me, the common man, by exploring uh, ideas towards chip based QKD using integrated photonics under the DST India Trento program for advanced research. Uh, well, while our lab continues to provide a leading role uh, in different domains of quantum science and technologies, I myself have the privilege of being an invited member of the United Nations Focus Group on Quantum Information Technology for Networks. And this is working on creating international standards for quantum. So uh, we hope that, you know, uh, with the upcoming national mission, uh, we hope to continue with renewed vigor uh, after this lockdown ends, uh, our journey towards uh, making India a, a leader in future quantum science and technologies. So this is all I wanted to say now, Mr. Dhar, and of course we have questions later. Thank you, thank, thank you Professor Sena, for your initial uh, thoughts and highlighting the work being done at RRI. So, with this, I'll move on to the next speaker, uh, Shri Sunil Gupta, co founder and CEO of Tune Labs, uh, for his initial thoughts and insights. Over to you. Uh, thank Mr. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dhar. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, uh, thanks to SHM for giving this opportunity uh, to speak uh, here. And, uh, and uh, thanks to all the fellow uh, speakers here for their great insights on quantum tech. So Curie Lab uh, actually started uh, was incubated in 2017 at IIT Madras and such part, and uh, with the focus of uh, building and in, uh, India's first uh, quantum uh, communication and security products. So, so what our vision was had been in the beginning uh, to uh, to build quantum trust for hyper secure hyper connected world, and uh, so what we did is that uh, in the last uh, four years we have gone ahead and built uh, several products and solutions. And the first one was a quantum random number generator, which is used by uh, several customers in India and in abroad uh, in uh, foreign countries. Then we went ahead and built our uh, uh, initially about 40, 60 kilometers uh, quantum key distribution product. Uh, that is again is used uh, in India and in Middle East by some customers. And, uh, and we have actually done 100 kilometers QKD in our labs in the last couple of weeks. Um, so now our next goal is to actually uh, break a 200 kilometer barrier for QKD. It's very glad to hear uh, from Professor uh, Dr. Sina that uh, integrated Q QKD chip work is happening. That is very exciting to to hear. And uh, and our uh, roadmap is now we are actually building uh, uh, a quantum technology for the IoT devices, which will again be available in a, in a couple of months. And uh, and we have already taken. Uh, uh, we are now working very closely with very large enterprises. The idea in uh, idea is to come up with some enterprise use cases, which is that which is key for uh, you know faster ad adoption of this technology for the commercial world. Uh, so that, that's from that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gupta, for your thoughts. Uh, so uh, it has been. Uh, Is it my connection or Siddhar? Oh, I'm also not getting anything. Oh, then it's okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Siddhar's uh, connection is. I, I think uh, his connection is probably. Uh, is it better? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Siddhar. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, we. Yeah. Her, we can't hear you. 
I think there's some connection problem at his end. Uh, Mr. Dhar, you can switch off your video. This might uh, give you a good uh, audio uh, question. Uh, let me give him a call. Mr. Dhar, can you? Mr. Dhar, can you hear us? This might take a moment or just uh, bear with us. Uh, I think he has disconnected. He is trying to connect again. Uh, there's a power cut at Mr. Thar's place. He is trying to log in from his phone. Uh, just give us two minutes.
Till uh, the time he is joining, let me put the questions that we have uh, to, to the uh, esteemed panelist. Uh, can I request Dr. B.K. Murthy? Uh, Honorable FM has spoken about the 8,000 crore national mission on quantum technologies and applications in the budget last year. According to you, yes. how important this mission would be to drive the quantum technology in India? What is the roadmap? You should uh, think the country should adapt for promoting the quantum in India. The role of uh, the role of government, the role of uh, technology, the role of uh, industry. Yeah, actually, this is uh, the DPR is uh, has been prepared by a few scientists and researchers included, and finally, it was it has been approved by the Apex Committee, uh, and that is now now addition to the government level. So while the EFC and then other government processes of cabinet note are being ready, the DPR mainly consisting of uh, various uh, components, which includes quantum computing, quantum uh, information processing, and uh, quantum communication. Planning to is each and each of the area is very important at each area one grand challenge is being taken by level. So that is how the whole uh, uh, project has been conceived. And this is being now uh, and spearheaded or steering by DST, but uh, MITE and DRDO and ISRO will be having major uh, uh, stakeholders in this program. So that is how the interministerial uh, steering will be done for this. So that is how the program. The program will have various components of creating an ecosystem of uh, academia and the government and institutions, R&D labs, and including the private participation, industry participation, as well as the startup companies, which will have a com complete component for this. And some components for the IPR generation and transfer of technologies also and creating some incubation and startup companies. Thank you, Mr. Murthy. Uh, moving on to Mr. Rapur, why is the quantum computing seen as the important paradigm shift in computing technology and considered to be the next big thing in technology? Yeah, so, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, oh, okay. Yeah, so I mean, uh, quantum computing and quantum, uh, various aspects of quantum technologies. Quantum computing is one aspect of quantum technologies. So basically, I mean, all through last century, we have been, uh, we have come across many devices, revolution, uh, this revolution in electronics devices and everything. Everything relied on the basic uh, fundamental principles of physics that were playing around at the atomic and molecular level. Now, these were uh, collective phenomena and collective uh, effects that we were using throughout last century for coming to where we are in terms of the technology development. Now, if you go deep into these uh, at the atomic or the photonic or the molecular scale, then there are many other effects that are playing uh, the role in, term, in terms of uh, giving the macroscopic effects and uh, all the uh, devices that we see right now. Now, going as we came into this new century, people have been realizing, or actually the seeds have been sown last century itself in the last uh, two decades of the last century on using the basic effects of quantum mechanics, such as and range correlations that exist between different particles because of the quantum mechanical phenomena. Now, people soon realize that if you go to that fundamental level, you can actually come out with very interesting uh, uh, things in making devices, in making computation using the superposition principle, for example, and the entanglement principle of uh, quantum states. Like in classical computers, you have uh, these bits, zero, and the, your state of a system can be only in two levels, zero and one. Whereas uh, in a quantum mechanical system, not only you have this fixed state zero and one, but uh, there is a possibility, infinite possibility of these, uh, any intermediate state that can exist in terms of superpositions of the zeros and ones. And also this strange phenomenon of uh, entanglement. Now, all these things have led to the use of uh, quantum systems for uh, applications wherein classical devices can only hit a 
wall in terms of their sensitivities and applications. Whereas in quantum system, if you use those principles, you can actually beat the classical limits that our conventional wisdom has allowed us to use the uh, use the systems for building any kind of device or even computers, etc. So uh, henceforth, going forward, there is so much potential that is there using this quantum mechanical systems and uh, for exploiting for technological applications, including quantum computing and various kinds of sensing. So there is a huge potential and we are looking forward to coming up with some great uh, applications going forward as, as collectively. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Rapul. Um, my next question would be for Professor Ubasi Sinha. As an academician and a scientist, what advice would you have for the government to help drive the momentum in quantum technologies in India? So thank you for this question. Um, so I'll break this question into two parts. Uh, so first of all, the academician and then the scientist one. So as I was saying that, you know, I have this involvement in this focus group uh, from the UN. So I have been participating in many such panel discussions of the last couple of years. And some of these questions that we are discussing are also uh, come up in the context of the international community. So what I found is that there is a lot of commonality between our thoughts in India and our peers abroad, and we can benefit immensely if we keep ourselves aligned with how things are being planned elsewhere as well. So first, as an academician, I would like to ensure that the uh, momentum in quantum technology is increased through active participation of different sectors and skill sets. So one of the major components of the country's considerations should be human resource development at various levels uh, to ensure that we develop a self-feeding community of experts. Right? So we need to revamp our coursework so that quantum sensitization happens with a bottom-up approach and young students participate in the excitement for possibilities through inclusion of such topics in undergrad as well as grad programs more uniformly than what we have right now. There should be components that appeal to scientists as well as engineers so that you know we can diversify our coursework in that uh, area as well. Now, coming to my role as a scientist, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, quantum science and technologies are still an emerging field with a lot of potential and we are now working on being quantum prepared. So we are not quantum ready yet, and this needs to be appreciated by the government agencies. Here I have this excellent opportunity of telling what I feel to the government agency, and I cannot you know, miss on this, right? So in order to proceed towards concerted development, we need investment of resources in basic R&D as well as applied technology. So scientists, I would say, they are best when they innovate, and they should be enabled to do so. These innovations can then be taken up by the industry to productivize the same. It was heartening to hear the Secretary of DST this morning emphasize the need to encourage blue sky research in fast moving areas like quantum. Uh, you know, we scientists, we work through a well-defined internationally accepted paradigm, which involves publishing our findings in peer reviewed fora, as well as patents and so on. So such practices should be encouraged and the government should also utilize the scientific pool wisely to help evaluate the potentiality of, you know, these potential startups and such exciting ones are with us in this one. This will help in ensuring that we produce products that meet certain scientific and quality standards. That is very important with all this resource allocation that we are talking about. I'll quote Professor Sharma again. Uh, Technology hunts in pairs, academia and industry go hand in hand. Thus, resource availability should be given to all sectors, some to invent, some to manufacture, while some to demonstrate live use cases. At the moment, I would say there is an apprehension in the scientific community that there may be some undue hype, you know, associated with quantum technologies that may alienate us from contributing to quantum science itself. So it is noteworthy that the domain of quantum science has actually led to huge discoveries for decades, even a century, I would say. When the laser was first invented, it was not with the backdrop of its commercial utility. Now we know how important it is in several applications. So the government has to note that it is from the academic and scientific sectors that we historically expect new ideas to develop. These ideas then mature into products. India has a history of excellent science. Let us ensure that this does not get overlooked in our quest towards commercialization. Give things some time to mature. Don't expect miracles. This is how other countries are approaching the problem with a multi-pronged planning that includes the scope for basic sciences, applied sciences, as well as field-based products. 
resources should also be spread out over a long timeline to enable concerted growth towards becoming quantum ready. As I said, we are quantum prepared right now. We need to be patient with the developments, and this also depends on the specific area of development. Thus, long term resource allocation would be preferred over a one time thrust where some people just, you know, as Professor Sharma said, it's not about grabbing something that is there. It is about making concerted long term contributions as a country, and we are capable of doing that. And the role of academia and science uh, is uh, extremely important, if not most important in this journey. So thanks, Varun, for this question. Varun, you're muted. I could see Mr. Dhar has joined back. Uh, Mr. Dhar, over to you to uh, take the questions with the panel. You are muted. Mr. Dhar, uh, can't hear you. He is on mute. Devrup ji, you are on mute. Uh, we can hear you uh, in bits and pieces. In the interest of time, uh, Mr. Dhar, uh, till your connection uh, improves, can I take the next question? Okay, uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I have another question for Mr. Abhishek Chopra. Uh, what is your view on commercialization of quantum technologies and how are the technology companies in India gearing up towards it? Uh, Mr. Chopra. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Nekarwal, for this question. Um, I think so. We are in the midst of the second wave of quantum technology. What we say, the so second wave is defined by commercialization because we are taking the preliminary research that we have done in labs uh, in the first first. Now it is in the in in the way that we are thinking about applications of those. So cryptography, sensing, um, this algorithm that we are developing for simulations. Um, and other such things. These, these are all the, the advent towards that the fact that we are towards the commercialization of the technology. I, I, I really agree to the point that Dr. Shina was mentioning that we are quantum prepared. So we have to be a bit more uh, resilient in, in thinking about how can we really bring about the change and then see the potential that quantum has to offer. Um, also, we have to be um, a bit more patient, I think. So that, that is where. Uh, my concern lies because there are only two segments of people that we see. One who believe technology and the potential of it, it stops creating the, the early hype, which was mentioned by, by the speaker. And also, there is second that they say that over okay, 20, 10, 20 years, 30 years, we, we are not going to realize a quantum computer. The middle ground here, I believe, which is very common. I mean, Everybody's collaborative effort when it comes together, that is where the, the technology is going to grow to the next level and to the potential because that is the transition point that we are going to see. And it is very heartening to see companies like IBM, uh, Microsoft, AWS, and all these big leaders are coming in um, and giving the fuel to the, to the quantum technology, uh, which is which is one one word that I like uh, by one of the by uh, Dr. Dr. Sivasta. She said that it's a long haul technology. And that is what we are preparing for. Um, what it means is we are transitioning, we are taking the quantum computing, quantum sensing, quantum cryptography to the actual users. So the companies that exist, like for example, Airbus did the quantum computing challenge, and there are many other such companies with startups across the globe are, are, are collaborating with in order to sense what is what what is the capability that quantum lights can offer. So I think so this 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 very well timed, but I, I really urge uh, that that the audience and, and the panelists all we think on that middle ground where we are that we, we can come and say that we are being patient and we work towards realizing this quantum technology. Thank you, Mr. Dhar. Uh, 
So, so Varun Sunil here, I'd just like to add uh, 10 seconds here. So while it is true that quantum computing technologies will probably take some more time and we need to be resilient to, to make sure that commercial from experiments and research to commercialization. But you know, the world over, you see that the quantum uh, quantum cryptography or quantum communication is already in the commercialization, right? So India can't miss that boat, right? So, and and that's what we are doing and the tech, tech bit is doing and many other companies. I think India, if India needs to really prove India needs to prove this point as well that India can not only do research, but also can do commercial products and can actually deploy and compete with the best in the world. So I think it is very important right now for the next two to three years, while our quantum computing teams and our research uh, becomes to a ready level, that we don't miss the miss the board of quantum communication. Just, just a few things to add to uh, 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 Abhishek's point. Uh, what I feel is that it is true that you know there are you know when we talk about quantum technology which is basically an umbrella term for you know several other technologies uh for some some fields actually need more research more pure research in terms of you know taking it forward but as uh, uh, mr sunil points it out that uh quantum communication is is getting commercialized when we talk about the 2000 kilometer network quantum network in China or a metropolitan network in Japan. And if you look at, if you, even if you do a, you know, a basic search of the patents filed in quantum communication, it reveals that everyone is way ahead in, you know, uh, as far as, you know, when we look at the things in India. So what I feel is that uh, we need to have a differential approach for some fields. Yes, we need to focus on the technology, uh, you know, in the research part. And for some, actually we need to actually, you know, uh, go go and uh, go towards commercialization. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Aaron. My next question is an extension of what we have just discussed. Uh, can I ask uh, Mr. Nixon Patil, what do you see are the biggest use cases for commercialization or commercial applications of quantum technologies in India? Thanks for the question, Mr. Aaron. Um, so I think based on the various speakers on the panel, I think I agree uh, that we are quantum ready and prepared, but there are all these uh, cases which we see on a daily basis that are uh, here in the West in terms of the use cases that are emerging in public sector, in finance, like I've been having steady conversations with large uh, brokers houses, uh, Goldman, JK, JP Morgan, all of them have quantum computing teams now. And there are various use cases like portfolio optimization, derivatives, pricing, value of course, so, so forth. So, right. so there are companies that are doing, applying them in transportation, like uh, VW, the logistic traffic management, and so forth. And obviously, strategic and military general applications are there, which are not known to us, especially in the quantum crypto and uh, crypto encryption and national security kind of thing, right? And then healthcare. And then healthcare with uh, especially the magnetic resonance imaging. Very recently, professors in UK came up with this whole uh, notion of entangled polarization of, of programs, which would make things very, very quick. So I think there are there are a lot of applications, maybe small applications, maybe uh, you know, sort of toy applications, but that scope is there. And we should not fear that India is going to miss the past because this revolution is just beginning to happen, commercialize. There'll be third, fourth, fifth wave of newer technologies and more complete technologies will be showing up. And I think if we build our base, we should not be missing out on our base. I think that's more critical. Like, for example, in US, they started a K to 12 for quantum computing, and I'm kind of part of that teaching with something called QEDC. Um, so I think that's where if we have thousands of students, they have to join an IBM Whiskit summer school. That itself is something that we should work on. I think that's more important that our institutes in India, the IIT, the ICERs, the RRIs or ISCs, they should be supporting those kind of students and like a small company like QLabs, we've been supporting like 50 interns, right? And most of these kids are not finding places where they go, can go and actually implement things. So 
So I think that's more important. If we build our base, if we build our foundations, then these use cases also will emerge. Like in our case, we are having small use cases from very, very junior people where we are building something, a mathematical model on quantum memory. And we have scanned all the papers that are there from time immemorial to 2021. And our mathematical models are showing we are at par with what the best of the world are doing, right? So we built the quantum network protocol, which is on top of what the Delft and the other guys have built, right? So with only maybe five or six or seven months of work. I'm sorry, and these can be now applied if, if the government uh, with the 8,000 crore, as uh, Professor Sinha said, provides that translational dollars to provide maybe a link where we people like us can you know, apply our algorithms where there are quantum optics labs which are set up in India, which can, you know, help people to bring these use cases. I think that's more important. Thank you, Mr. Thank Patel. You Anybody wants to add anything to it? Yeah, I will, Sunil here. I'll just add, uh, uh, so in the, in the quantum communication world, I think uh, when we look at it, uh, 5G, there are there are very interesting use cases for quantum uh, security for front hall and back hall. There are very interesting use cases for banks where a lot of uh, application moving to cloud. So in order for the cloud application to get enough entropy, uh, which is not a, which not normally available through system, uh, there are uh, there are application use cases available where uh, quantum entropy as a service can be offered to this uh, cloud application in the cloud, right? We are also seeing a lot of uh, uh, smaller devices like point of sale machine, uh, mobile devices, uh, IoT devices. These are traditionally have no encryption or very less security, and they are going to be the biggest uh, target points. So how do we use quantum uh, technology and security embedded in these devices so that they do not become a bots tomorrow, right? So the very interesting use cases coming in, in that area as well, right? Yeah, I think I think I, I echo that, and I've been working with another group and we saw recently, right, the dark, dark matter guys uh, sabotaged the pipeline from Louisiana to Maine, and that was because they hacked the uh, IoT devices. And I think uh, that's another area where use cases are, are very simple, very little quantum resources are required, and we in India have the talent to you know, focus on that direction and bring out use cases and the end devices. Yeah, next device. So, so right now, if you see log from cloud to core network and up to edge and uh, edge and endpoints, all through there is a use cases for quantum quantum security. Definitely. Thank you, Mr. Gupta. My next question will be to you only. Can you please tell us more about the journey of how quantum technology has moved from research to production in India? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Arun. Um, so it's been a very interesting uh, story four years ago, five years ago, when we used to talk about quantum. And, you know, the, most of our effort and energy should just go towards explaining what is quantum, right? And after that, we will the customer will never come back for the second call, right? They always said it's a futuristic technology and uh, something that they can't understand. But that, but I'm trying to tell you in the last six months, what we are seeing is is very interesting story that a lot of enterprises are proactively coming to us, government, defense, outside players. So there's a, there is definitely a big shift in terms of understanding uh, of that. So there are three aspects of it, bringing from lab to, uh, to you know, uh, commercialization. First aspect is, I call it proof of uh, technology, right? How do we convert science into tech? So you need to have your protocols, your uh, how the, you build a noiseless system. So there are a lot of engineering uh, required there, that, and there's a convergence of actually photonics, computer science, quantum physics come together to solve that problem. It's not an easy problem to solve to get a commercial system, but you need to do that. Once you do that, then the next problem becomes this proof of business. Somebody needs to pay you for that and uh, to, to buy that and it should work. So then, and I think the biggest challenge right now is first building the technology and the product that really means uh, very easy to install and deploy, and then to come up with the interesting use cases so that people can really use it meaningfully and then uh, get benefit out of it. So I think that this journey is on. Technology is available in India today. It can be commercialized. Several people are offering that. But I think the real interesting part is that how deeply you're involved with customer and co-creating these use cases. So I think that's the journey that is on today. But India is definitely on the on the on the on the world map of quantum uh, communication and security, offering products to to the world. So we are the we are the front, we are one of the front runners there.
Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Anybody else who wants to add to it? Okay, my next question would be to Mr. Animesh Aryan. What role can the quantum technology play in data security, cyber security in today's data centric world? Aryan? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Varun. Uh, I'll, I'll try to explain this in, in, uh, kind of, you know, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, what we see is that, you know, as our world has become more and more digital, it is needless to say that, that uh, uh, data is the new oil. And the recent advancements in artificial intelligence tells us that, you know, computers can process and understand bulk data, which is beyond, you know, human capabilities. And uh, any country, for that matter, which, you know, which fails to secure its data, is at the verge of becoming a digital colony, uh, where you know any any adversary or a group of adversaries can manipulate and misuse the information and thereby threaten the lives of its citizens. So uh, I mean, this is this is what we see in today's digital world. Uh, in addition, I mean, you know what has happened is that with the advent of a uh, you know large scale quantum computers in near future, uh, which which on you know on a positive side will have uh, you know enormous computational power. But on the other hand, uh, it, 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 you know, the existing crypto systems will, will no longer be safe. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, encryption, public key encryption algorithms like RSA, uh, which are based on mathematical complexities, uh, they will not be withstand quantum computers. So uh, quantum computers have already, you know, exposed the underlying weakness in asymmetric algorithms. And these are basically, these are routinely used for, you know, key exchange, digital signature, certificates, et cetera. Therefore, it is very imperative uh, that we are proactive and, uh, you know, uh, and we actually adopt uh, quantum proof solutions now, uh, instead of, you know, had doing some knee jerk reactions, you know, when we see, you know, uh, the, the systems, you know, completely uh, hijacked. So that's what I feel about uh, the role. Uh, what role quantum can do is that in its present form, uh, quantum key distribution can make uh, our data quantum computer resilient within within of course within certain limitations you know with it in terms of the distance and the boundaries uh but the cost of ownership uh, you know because the technology is, is you know is evolving uh is is high and therefore it is suited for you know big organization you know mega organizations governments and defense institutions so what we feel is that in the near term uh, this adaptation of organizations uh, you know you adopting adopting this technology will lead to building a robust backbone of networks which can be used for secure telecommunication, banking, and financial transactions. Whereas, you know, in, uh, in probably uh, in, in the next decade, we will have, you know, a worldwide QKD network, uh, which, uh, you know, paired with fiber networks for safely exchanging keys and transporting them around the globe. So that's, that's what I feel that quantum, I mean, uh, to put it in a nutshell, the impact of uh, quantum technologies on cybersecurity is profound and game changing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Aryan. My next question would be to Dr. B.K. Murthy. How can the Indian quantum technology industry work and collaborate with government to drive the growth agenda in the uh, uh, Dr. Murthy? Yeah, good afternoon to all. Uh, actually, this, this is the emerging technologies area is one of the important area where the industry is playing a key role in collaboration with the government and other stakeholders, including the academy and other people. You know, I, I have not seen personally in any other area, except maybe civil engineering, mechanical engineering and other thing, there is a huge gap between the academy and industry. But in the emerging technologies area, either quantum technology, blockchain, AI, IoT, all these areas, there is completely people are working hand in hand. Both the government as well as the academia, research labs, and the startup companies, or the even the industry also. Take for example the quantum technology. This area alone, we are working. I mean, DRDO and then DST and all of us, all the government organizations are working very closely with the industry as well. Be it uh, uh, multinational companies like Atos and then AWS and uh, IBM. And also the startup companies like QNU Labs and then Q Labs and other people also we are working very closely. So I don't see there won't be any difficulty in getting a collaboration with these people and we are conducting a lot of grand challenges and uh, the industry is welcome to participate in any of these things. Like for example, the IIT Roorkee, the courseware and other thing that QU Labs play some significant role. 
and then drd was uh, the strategic uh, communication the, the the project that has been that is being uh, uh, pursued in uh, iit i mean in hyderabad so q u labs or q new labs also has participated a lot so i think uh, there is a good synergy between these uh, industry and academia and the other uh, research labs and the government yeah, most welcome sure. anyone wants to collaborate with the government most welcome even the new program of the dst national mission on quantum technologies application nmqta has envisages a lot of incubation facilities a lot of uh, ipr transfer of technologies and then collaboration with the industry industry participation is a major component of that thank That's you dr murthy yeah. thank you dr murthy we have mr devrup dar joined us Amchadar, I've taken the uh, first eight questions. Now over to you. We have sure. another 10, 15 minutes to continue with the session. Sure. Uh, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can see you. Sure. I'm sorry for the the inconvenience and thanks uh, Varun for stepping in and taking over. So uh, uh, my uh, next question is to Dr. Umakant uh, Rapol. So. As an academician and scientist, I'm considering that uh, there's a huge requirement in this field. Do you see students coming in, showing interest, uh, coming in for masters or research in uh, this subject? And what can be done to ensure that we get more and more talent in this subject? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, let me take the first part of the question, which is, uh, do we see enough students coming in for masters or research program in this subject? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, in the recent years, there is uh, we see a sudden growth in the awareness among students at our undergraduate and postgraduate level. I mean, my personal experience and experience of several colleagues in our institute and many other institutes, there is a growing awareness and uh, we get a lot of requests regularly for doing projects in our groups, either be it theory or experiments. So, there is a there is enough interest among students coming into the uh, try, uh, wanting to come into this area. And the reason, one of the reasons being when we talk to students is that this particular area involves a variety of uh, technological areas in addition to the experience of learning the four fundament, foundational pillars of physics, which normally all the students, whoever does physics, they learn the four foundational pillars of physics. In addition to that, they in this particular area, they see a lot of exciting hands-on work in cross-disciplinary areas, which includes uh, basically other than physics, there is a lot of engineering, mechanical, electrical, electronics engineering that goes into this other than just the physics that they learn. <clears throat> so, and coming to the quantum technology part, so there are many concepts, the quantum concepts that so far for them just remain elusive and were restricted only to just reading in the books. Now they can see these concepts at work in real life. That makes them very excited, keeps them excited and also raises the motivational levels of the students to pursue quantum physics and the technologies associated with quantum physics. Now, in my personal experience since last year, I see a huge rise in the number of requests that I get from students to pursue projects in my group and also my colleagues at the institute. So that's the thing. And the biggest advantage with uh, taking students at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels in our groups to do short term projects is that their minds are fresh. They are very creative and very often come up with ideal out of the box. And we at ICER get to experience this more because of the way the curriculum is designed. And that brings me to the second part of the question. That is, what can be done to attract more students? Now, one of the things is, of course, there has to be a redesign of the curriculum at the undergraduate and postgraduate. Uh, level, not only uh, to attract uh, students only to quantum technology areas, but to experimental physics in general, because of whatever the tradition or whatever experience we have seen in the past is that a majority of the fraction of students still wants to do their theoret pursue theoretical physics, 
Now, in order to excel, okay, while that is extremely important to know all the theoretical concepts, it is also very important that uh, we cultivate uh, an atmosphere of attracting students to do experimental sciences in general. And for this particular thing, quantum technologies. So one of the things that can be done is one has to ramp up undergraduate and postgraduate laboratory courses so that we introduce the students to the concepts of say quantum phenomenon when we are talking about quantum technology in particular like designing simple experiments from photonics and atomic spectroscopy or uh, other areas wherein they can actually see some of the basic concepts or basic uh, experiments that would have been discussed in classic textbooks they can actually get a hang of this uh, experiments right hands on in the labs and we do some of these in our research labs because of as i pointed out earlier because of the nature of the curriculum that we have at icer and i think that works very well because if you get students at an early stage in that maybe second or third year into the research labs in experiencing in actually interacting with the students who are already doing their phd getting involved in smaller projects that keeps them hooked up to this particular area for a much much longer time and we see that i mean students who have joined our labs and groups at say second or third year of their undergraduate they have already gone on, gone to do phd's in many uh, places abroad and in india and have also finished their phd's and pursuing this particular area all even now other thing that we can think of doing or we should be doing more is we have to have targeted summer research programs meaning targeted towards quantum technologies and many institutes should come together have either a combined uh, summer research program which is operated in a distributed fashion some of these things we are actually thinking of employing in uh, the technology innovation hub that we have established at icer pune the other thing is many uh, so most of the students it's hard to travel abroad so we should uh, work together with uh, some of the companies and startups that i see today have been already established at uh, in india they should offer more internship programs like the q labs and uh, we should they should also approach different institutes we should also be approaching them to see where the students can do their internship programs for example some of the institutes have a complete one year long research project which is included in their curriculum towards the fulfillment of their masters project projects so those platforms we should utilize together and work together with these companies and get the students do their internship programs at that in those places and of course the last and most important one is public outreach i think we need to all of us need to make much more efforts in reaching out to students at various levels and public in general <laughs> students for especially from the school to starting from school to postgraduate levels in different remote uh, places remote schools and colleges because talent is everywhere talent is not restricted to just urban locations so we should make more efforts in uh, doing public outreach so i think um, some of these things we are already planning in our quest program and also the nmicps program which we will be implementing soon but uh, everybody involved in the country in this program should be working towards this that's my request that's it thank you i would just like to take a moment uh, uh, let me welcome uh, mr uma maheshwaran uh, who is the scientific secretary isro and my chairman for the national council on it ids and e-commerce dr lavi chanana uh, thank you sir for joining uh, mr devrupa over to you sure thanks thanks varun uh, cognizant of the time that we are running late so i'll try to uh, wrap up very quickly and uh, maybe the next few questions will uh, do it in a way that uh, we get uh, the views of the experts in a minute or so so i'll move on to mr aryan uh, uh, now, uh, how, as a country, we become atmanirbhar in quantum technology, and where do you see the role of uh, associations, industry associations like Astrochem coming in over here? So, over to you, Mr. Ali. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Mr. Dar. First thing is that uh, 
uh, I would I would be able to take you know the first half of the, of the question and second half is where you know SOCHAM can itself you know play a much more better role in terms of defining what needs to be done. I have a few points to make, uh, which is that um, any country you know uh, tech, uh, I mean and for the development of any country, uh, technology and entrepreneurship is is central to its uh, to its development. And what uh, history has taught us is that a technology can flourish. Uh, only when the key essentials are put together. And we, when we talk about uh, this, uh, I call it something like a GUI model, which is, you know, we have government, the government initiative, uh, we have the university which does the research, and we have industry and industries association, you know, where actually things can be commercialized. So what I feel is that uh, for India to be art and uh, the following should be helpful. The first one, which I think, uh, I think, uh, already everybody has covered is that there has to be a change uh, in the coursework. We need to actually have a more trained and skilled people uh, in this particular segment. The second should be uh, is is actually having a clear understanding uh, of the technology, which means that what uh, at what stage uh, which technology is, which uh, is something like quantum tech communication. Uh, which is at the level of commercialization, whereas something in terms of metrology uh, is 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 being researched. So we have to chalk out different strategies, near term as well as long term. Uh, the third uh, the third is uh, actually you know enabling funds for cutting edge research, and uh, which could be in collaboration with industry and academia partners. So this will actually help us, you know, having the best people because, you know, when we have uh, re only research institutions, uh, the the best brains will actually go and work somewhere outside. So we have to actually have them here. That is that is very important. Uh, and the fifth one is uh, fifth one. Uh, fourth one is actually, you know, we I mean, we as a country have very few compliances in terms of, you know, when we look at data security or uh, you know something like data localization so we must have some sort of a zero tolerance policy towards uh, data security and there should be a strict compliance because only then you know industries and other organizations can come in to you know upgrade their existing technologies uh, fifth fifth uh, is you know do uh, actually incentivizing startups you know, working in innovative technologies. This is not only for you know quantum, but you know something. Some some company which is working in e-com. How do you you know put it in the same category uh, as you know where where the I would say the product market fit is yet to be evolved. So that's where I feel that you know uh, uh, the government should. I mean everybody you know because all of us are in a way enablers for this technology. So uh, that is how I feel that you know things can be worked out. And I feel that Asocham to, to start with has done a good job, you know, that where they have brought everybody together on a central platform. So I think anybody else can also add into this particular question. Yeah, so, uh, so Aryan, Animesh, I will add, uh, Mr. Thari, if you allow me. Uh, just since the Atom Nirbhar came, I just want to let, because there are a lot of audience here, that today India is Atom Nirbhar in quantum communication and security. Today, India's first quantum secure fully digitized quantum secure video conference solution was deployed a month ago, right? Which is fully developed video conference solution was developed by Indian uh, startup and the quantum security technology was given by us, integrated together and deployed, right? India is first, probably world first. Now the, the important part that I want to do is the collaboration is very important, right? So there are several startups are there. I think they need to come and collaborate. Some of the, and each one of them can bring their own strength to the table. And I think the power of ecosystem and collaboration can't be ignored. And that is where the Indian strength, India strength is, right? Indian Atom Network cannot be individual companies doing it. Alone. Yes. Sure. I think that's that's a great point. Uh, thanks, Mr. Aryan uh, and Mr. Gupta. So, in uh, sure, uh, I'm cognizant of the time. So, probably the last uh, question that I have is uh, for Professor uh, Sinha. Uh, in your uh, talk earlier, you spoke about communication and how uh, RRI is playing a great role in terms of uh, uh, quantum technology driving communication. So maybe if you can just talk a bit more about that in terms of how this is moving on and what's the future of it. Yeah, so thanks, uh, Mr. Thar. So uh, just uh, to add to this Atman Nirbhar point, you know, before I answer your quantum communications question, I think, you know, we need to also become self sufficient in the enabling technologies which lead to quantum, whether it is developing our own fibers in India, developing our own lenses, mirrors. 
I don't know, detectors. So that is also something to keep in mind because otherwise we will be importing things and then doing our protocol. That's not going to serve us in the long run. Regarding communication, yes, uh, I mean, you know, I think a lot was already covered by the various speakers. So keeping time in mind, I would just like to say that essentially we are talking about two different uh, domains of communication. One is non-strategic and one is strategic, right? So what, where quantum communication will come in is in the strategic communication where security is of importance. And so if security is of importance, as Animesh talked about cybersecurity, there are other types of security, whether it is, you know, whether I want to vote for party X and party Y gets the vote, that is another thing we don't want, uh, whether it is defense, whether it's banking. So people like you and me are actually using online banking every day. I'm talking to you in an online forum today it's not very secure, but it need not be. So the, today uh, in the lockdown that we are currently in, in Karnataka, we see that uh, cyber security is something which really has uh, become of paramount importance in our lives. In, uh, and so uh, if there is a better way of handling this, then of course it needs to be addressed. And so there are vulnerabilities in the current way of doing things in, if you know, in uh, what the problems are with private key and public key, it's the algorithmic breakthroughs which will create problems. The uh, quantum computer will create problems. So we need to come up with a solution where we can, you know, beat the quantum problem with a quantum solution. And so that is where our quantum communication comes in. And so quantum key distribution is using laws of quantum mechanics to secure our key distribution problem. And so fundamentally different in its scope. And of course, giving us information theoretically secure communication, as we say, which is future secure. And that is very important. So 15 years down the line, if I pass on my, uh, you know, uh, something to my progeny, they should get it. So it shouldn't be that, you know, I've moved on and then somebody else has also had the bank account. So this should be future secure. So that is where it will have a huge impact in the communication space, where it will give us future secure information, theoretically secure communication going on towards our quantum networks, right? So we talked about this, Sunil, Animesh, all of them uh, talked about the various layers in networks. So the key distribution is an important layer. There are other layers and people are solving those problems. So it has to be taken together. So when we talk about that maneuver, we we produce our QKD, but then the other layers of the network also need to be uh, indigenized, right? So the whole thing, and whether it's point to point, and whether you know we are doing satellite based, uh, whether somebody is doing fiber, all this comes together towards what we call the global quantum communication network. And maybe some of us will live to see it in the global uh, platform. Hopefully, some most of us will survive the current pandemic. But then, having said that, this is the general idea, and the impact is huge. I mean, it's kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, it's all. Uh, uh, Positive. And again, quoting Ashutosh Sharma, uh, this is where we need to be positive, uh, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, develop these things uh, layer by layer, not just the protocol. And that is where this academia industry thing comes in. Because, you know, the academia will be excellent in coming up with the new protocols and the new proofs and the new ideas. And then the industry picks it up and makes a product out of it. So we are all, you know, self sufficient in our huge country. Right? And so, uh, uh, yeah, I don't want to go into the details of the I'll physics of quantum communication, but I think this is the general flavor of where the impact will be in communication space. Yeah, in, in fact, uh, sorry, just to add on to Dr. Roshi's point, you know, I feel that is, she's correct on the part that um, that existing, the supporting agent technologies are important, and we depend a lot. There's a lot of dependency on getting, you know, hardware from outside India. Which is you know basically because we miss the semiconductor fabrication you know wave that's so it is important that if we have this then the research can also be expanded you know the cost of research can also be reduced yeah when yeah. you have if i if i may if i may jump in what Please. relevant point is if you look at the 12 years ago when the india got into the solar i was one of the early guys who got a license there so they had a very good policy that 80 percent of all the capex that was uh used for setting up the plan, you have got tax deductions. I think something like that, a policy is should have required in India. Secondly, I think you have to have something like the quantum startup foundries that have, they have in US and Canada and elsewhere, right? Which is where you're losing a lot of, like I've lost seven or eight very good guys last year, but there are no labs or no way to do that, right? Thirdly, I think the K-12 education has to happen. All you university guys, all you profs, I mean, you don't have to rely on the central government to fund these things. You have your time, donate your time, create those K to 12 uh, things, and get people when they are young. I think these few things, if you do well, I think then there's no stopping anymore. 
I, I just would like to add a point on on what the panelists are saying, especially on the Atmanir point. I talk to uh, students a lot uh, on a regular basis. Uh, I touch base with them. A lot of internship request comes. Uh, but but there's another side to the story, which where we have a lot of interest in, in uh, research, uh, where people want to get into the research, but people always think about job perspective, which is like, uh, do we get a job in this field? Like if we come and take a course, we do master, will we get the job? So, uh, that is the part of it. So, so I think, uh, yeah, so uh, very valid points and uh, it was uh, a great session and I know we have run out of time. So uh, I would like to thank all the panel members, esteemed guests and uh, above all Asochem for organizing this uh, great session. Uh, it was wonderful uh, getting to know more about quantum technology and the work being done. Uh, what government is doing, what research institutes, academic institutes are doing, and what the private sector is doing. Uh, with this, I will hand it back to uh, Varun. Uh, Varun, over to you uh, for the next session. And once again, thanks to all the uh, guests, the panel members for joining us today. Thank Varun, you, thank you Mr. Dhar. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mr. Dhar. Thank I would you. like to thank all the panel members. And thank now we start the valedictory session. Can I request? Uh, Dr. Lavnish Channa, Chairman of the Asuchan National Council on IT, ITS, and E-Commerce, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Channa. I think he's having some connection issues. I can see his name. He had joined back. Uh, Dr. Channa is just joining. He has lost the connection, so he's trying to connect back. Over to you, Dr. Chalana. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, so the moment uh, this was to start, my my connection got uh, disconnected as as it normally happens. Uh, do we have uh, Mr. Saraswat also? Dr. Saraswat? Uh, Mr. Saraswat uh, might not join. He's uh, still in call with the demo. 
so if he is able to uh, finish that he might but it uh, looks little difficult okay great no problem okay so let me start then uh, uh, mr r umameshwaran uh, scientific uh, secretary isro mr darshan hiranandani chairman of the sochm national council on data center uh, ladies and gentlemen indeed an honor and a privilege uh, for me to be uh, here at the valedictory session of the india quantum technology conclave we are truly honored by the presence of uh, mr uma maheshwaran uh, as well as with uh, mr Gra darshan hiranandani it will be a great opportunity for all of us to listen to them and learn about uh, this evolving discipline uh, with a truly truly disruptive potential i just want to take this opportunity to set the context by reiterating and recollecting things about quantum tech, uh, computing a broad understanding of uh, the quantum computing areas highlighting some of the potential uh, applications uh, our understanding of uh, some of the government initiatives and the potential areas uh, for government ind industry collaboration as was highlighted in the previous sessions uh, so as as many speakers since the morning have described uh, you know just uh, to reiterate uh, quantum computing as we understand is a is a computational technology at the intersection of uh, quantum physics and uh, computer science we have understood that uh, quantum computer is a device that makes use of uh, direct use of quantum mechanical phenomena uh, to perform operations on data which is which is normally encoded in uh, qubits uh, you know a qubit is a well defined two level quantum system which constitutes the basic computation unit of a quantum computers now if i look back if you look back in 1994 when peter shor uh, uh, formulated his algorithm of uh, integer uh, factorization that will work only on a quantum computer there were there could have been only few enthusiasts there uh, uh, who would have believed that time uh, in the feasibility of the technologies required to build such a computer and frankly ever since that time we we are actually in a race uh, in quantum technology a race to build quantum computers with more qubits uh, than 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 with than by others uh, uh, today you know all of us uh, know that maybe 50 qubits may 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 suffice uh, to be the most uh, powerful classic computers or 4000 uh, to to actually break the cryptography and 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 the race has now reached a certain point where the computation and application world will no longer be the same as we know it today and and, and in a parallel to moore's law all of us know that the number of qubits has been doubling every one and a half years so now in terms of the application potential uh, you know the the quantum computing has a potential to provide a polynomial speed up uh, over the classical computing and an exponential speed up for problems now massive uh, parallelism obviously is fundamental to quantum computing uh, and 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 many countries including india there are there are substantial investments and efforts being made at universities uh, corporations and government agencies to invent uh, this uh, invent and build uh, the radically different uh, kind of uh, computing technologies now uh, next to the uh, basic science we under, uh, as we understand there are four distinguishable quantum domains if we can uh, uh categorize so first obviously is the quantum uh, simulation that's targeting the modeling of quantum systems and their dynamics very essential for uh, material sciences chemistry and pharmacy the second domain as we see it is quantum sensing metrology and imaging that is focusing on the use and measurement of uh, quantum properties with applications like medical imaging and high precision uh, navigation the third uh, as as many speakers spoke uh, in the session before this is quantum communication that is making use of uh, quantum properties and law of uh, quantum mechanics uh, to transfer information in a more secure way than the technologies in place today than they can do and finally the the quantum computation that relies on advances of all the other domains uh, and promises uh, enormous computation powers to solve problems that are practically unsolvable today. now some of the application areas with a potential of problem statements uh, that would require probably a classical computer billions of years to solve may may include uh, areas like climate change designing better drugs uh, you know eradicate diseases you know designing uh, better batteries improving supply chain logistics uh, you know and another very important uh, area that i wanted to highlight is the opening of the new frontiers in computing 
communication, cybersecurity with the, a very widespread application. Now, from a government perspective, obviously, uh, all of us are aware the government in the budget for 2020 has announced a national mission on uh, quantum technologies and applications. There's a total budget of 8,000 crores for a period of five years, uh, and this is being implemented by the Department of Science and Technology. As we understand, it's a pan India mission being implemented through academic and <coughs> just, uh, spread across the countries. And the objective is to develop uh, quantum computers, develop highly secured quantum communications, quantum key distribution, quantum clocks, quantum sensors, devices, human resource development, and uh, you know international collaborative research in startups. Now this is this is something that uh, and and it's expected that on mission on the successful implementation of uh, uh, a mission of uh, a quantum computer with around 50 qubits uh, using at least one of the technological approaches can be built in a time frame of five years. Now that's something that um, uh, you know uh, the 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 potential uh, that is being recognized now. Coming to some of the areas where probably government industry collaboration uh, can happen. So obviously one area is the larger development field itself. And uh, uh, you know, as Mr. Murthy mentioned in the morning in the, in the session before this, this is one area where uh, the gap between academia and industry in terms of research is actually becoming very, very negligible. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of this, there is a, they, we are going hand in hand uh, and, and also in terms of bringing the relevant use cases uh, that, uh, that that can help uh, in the uh, you know in the advancement of this uh, and the application. So at SHM, uh, you know, as the IT council, we do undertake regular awareness and appreciation exercise like the one that we are having today, and and we it will be a pleasure or and we'll be happy with the strength of all our member companies to take this uh, collaboration uh, forward. Thank you very much uh, once again, and we look forward to hearing from the distinguished speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Can I now request uh, Shri Simon Severini, Director of Quantum Computing, Amazon Web Services, and Professor of Physics, uh, University College of London, to kindly make his address. So, um, I have made you the presenter. You can share your screen. Yes, thank you. And my apologies, we have to wake up, uh, wake you up at 3 a.m. In, in the night. No worries. So, uh, is my screen visible? Yes, it is. Okay. So, um, so first of all, thank you very much for the very kind invitation to take part into this uh, into this meeting. So, it's it's my pleasure and my honor. So, I am I'm based in Seattle, which is on the west coast of the United States. So, it's 2 a.m. So, I hope that uh, the audience will forgive me if I will not be very precise. During my presentation, due to the time, um, I I um, would like to spend just a few minutes to um, give you what is the perspective of Amazon Web Services, the company in which I work. So, in my role, I um, am in charge of the strategy in quantum technologies for Amazon Web Services. So, I have an academic background, and I also have an affiliation as a professor uh, at UCL, which stands for University College London. Um, at AWS, we have um, a perspective that includes three initiatives. Um, the first initiative is called Amazon Bracket. So this is a service whose idea is to uh, give access to quantum computers available today, built today, um, for the purpose of um, uh, democratizing this technology. What, what does it mean? Sometimes the term democratizing is used uh, with various different meanings. In my perspective, it's important at this stage, which is very, very early in quantum computing, to uh, give a broad access to quantum computers um, as the technology evolves, so that um, scientists and researchers out there can try to figure out uh, um, applications of quantum computers, and hopefully a service that allows access to quantum computers can speed up uh, the technology itself can help accelerate innovation. The second, uh, the second initiative is called Amazon Quantum Solutions Lab. This is a consulting business that helps customers engaging uh, in quantum computing, trying to understand what is the trajectory of this uh, field 
and when, in case, quantum computers will be useful uh, in business. I, I need to stress again that quantum computing, it's a very early technology and a lot of working to be done in science, still and engineering, so that quantum computing will become a reality which has commercial impact. The third initiative is called Edible Center for Quantum Computing, and this is our R&D effort, which is in partnership with, with, with some universities, including Caltech, Stanford, Harvard, MIT, and University of Chicago. Um, Amazon Bracket is, as I mentioned, a fully managed service that allows customers to access securely on the AWS cloud quantum computers. And this is a real cloud service, meaning that uh, uh, customers can use all the tools that are available on AWS cloud from the same console, and they can have a notification via CloudWatch, they can have storage via S3, they have identity and access management, and, and, they, and they can use the service securely, meaning that the data is uh, secure in transit at addressed. At the moment, we have three different types of quantum computers built with ion traps, with superconducting qubits, and some quantum annealers, which is a different type of technology. And this is uh, integrating the cloud, meaning that the, the uh, customers can also access some simulators um, to use, for example, as a test bed for, uh, for running some, some uh, algorithms uh, on, on a small number of qubits, but also uh, full integration with classical resources. And um, this is just a snapshot of the console of Amazon Bracket with the machines available at the moment. These are the type of computers that are uh, available uh, right now on the service. As I mentioned, three different types of technologies. In my perspective, it's very important since customers often ask uh, uh, help, try to understand what is real about quantum computing and where the technology is today. And this is an opportunity for customers to actually verify this themselves, to see where is quantum computing by having access to uh, what the state of the art of the technology is. This is just a slide about the workflow for quantum computers. It's important to remember that when people say quantum computers will replace traditional computers in many ways, of course, for certain specific problems, quantum computing promises to bring some advantage at some point in the future, but it's also important to consider that is not an easy engineering task to figure out how to um, use a quantum computer and as part of a complex uh, IT infrastructure. And of course, quantum computers, classical computers work in tandem in that. Indeed, if we think about applications today, quantum computers today are mostly used to better understand quantum computers of the future. And that's also why it's very important collaboration between academia and industry. And that's why uh, it's important to stress the importance of fundamental research. But if we think about the possibility of applications in the real term, maybe these applications are going to be in um, a certain uh, uh, environment that includes quantum computers and traditional computers, classical computers together, what is called variational algorithms that indeed use quantum computers and traditional computers in tandem. And in, certain, in a certain sense, this is reminiscent of the process that is often used in machine learning via iterative uh, processes like, uh, uh, like training of networks. I'm not saying that quantum computers are particularly good in machine learning applications. I'm just saying that in spirit, if we look for near-term application, possibly these near-term applications are going to be uh, in, in the use of quantum computers used together in tandem with traditional, with classical computers. So, um, we have a project, an initiative that we launched together with MITI, the, the Ministry for Electronics and Information Technology in India, and we're giving access um, in partnership with MITI to the quantum computers available and, and the resources available on, uh, on Amazon Bracket to, to universities and organizations in India that would like to, to start, l uh, uh, start using these machines for experimenting and, and hopefully uh, accelerating innovation in this space. In India. Now, um, what is important, at least in my perspective, when we consider a service like Bracket, is building on Bracket. So there are many companies out there that use AWS to build um, companies that belong to any uh, any area uh, in business uh, and also uh, research. And uh, uh, if I consider this perspective of building in Bracket, uh, I, I like to interpret Bracket as a kind of infrastructure that that people can use 
for example, to build their own business and applications. There are some startups out there that indeed are uh, building uh, applications for the future when quantum computers will, uh, will be more powerful, but they use Bracket as an infrastructure. Just as a few names, QC Ware, which is a company in Palo Alto, Blue Cat in Japan, QNCO in the Netherlands, Reply in Italy. We have some customers that at the moment are also engaging with the technology, like Fidelity, Volkswagen, Amgen, or Enel, to mention some, uh, some public referenceable customers. And again, uh, I believe it's very important to accelerate innovation in this space, which, as I said, it's very early days, but eventually will be an interesting opportunity. But if we want to accelerate innovation, we need to bring together many different stakeholders and indeed academia, but also companies and, uh, and organization, startup have an important role to try to, 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 uh, to make spin this innovation flywheel where different stakeholders work together and, uh, and interact with each other to accelerate innovation. I mentioned the Quantum Social Startup, which is, a, which is an organization that helps customers engage with technology and also uh, auditing what customers are doing now, possibly machine learning and high performance computing. That can be what is available today and, and uh, um, that could help customers in their journey when uh, potentially quantum computers will be useful. But of course, as I said, uh, since it's very early days, there's a chance that there are other solutions out there that customer can benefit. We are working on, um, on uh, our own hardware. Um, we have a research center that is based in the campus of Caltech, California Institute of Technology. There we develop some uh, um, machines that are based on a type of qubit, which is called electroacoustic. Here is just a screenshot of the first page of a paper with some of of um, the people that work in, in our center. Uh, the organization is run by Oscar Painter for hardware and Fernando Brandao for, for error correction and algorithms. And uh, there's a number of people that are part of this organization also in a part-time form as Amazon scholars like John Pransky at Caltech. So we believe that this is an opportunity um, uh, and uh, we believe that error correction is really, really important for making quantum computers a reality. And with our architecture, we have some approach that should bring some improvement on the overhead of a physical qubit for, for logical qubits for the people in the audience that are familiar with this, with this terminology. And of course, in order to realize this, we need to work in full stack because a lot of different parts need to get together in order to, to realize uh, what is the full potential of quantum computers. This express our long-term commitment in the field. So we're actually opening a building in the Caltech campus uh, during this summer. And uh, I think I'm already running out of time. So I wish to thank you again for, for the very kind opportunity uh, to, uh, that, that you gave me to, today to present uh, very quickly what we are doing at AWS. And I'm happy to answer any question as they're now on offline, of course, by email. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, okay. Mr. Salvini. Uh, can I request our guest of honor for today, uh, Shri Uma Maheshwaranji, Scientific Secretary, ISRO, to kindly address the stakeholders. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, uh, am I audible to all of you? Yes, sir. So, very good afternoon, uh, Dr. Ravnish Chanana, Chairman Association, National Council. Uh, Sri Darshan Hiranandani, Chairman Association National Council on Data Centers, and all the uh, Sri Simon Severinini, and all other distinguished uh, participants of this uh, very good, very important, and very apt, I would say, conclave. Uh, at the outset, I take this opportunity to thank Association for having organized the Indian Content Technology Conclave, IQTC 2021 with the theme, unlocking the potential of quantum for India, and invited me to be part of this program. It is an event wherein the country's quantum technologists, the scientists, the academicians, the industry all meet at the same time, same platform to witness the enormous quantum potential 
the control. As you all know, quantum mechanics is altogether a novel way to look at physics. It was born in the 20th century and is now ready to offer a number of incredible disruptive technological applications. India is not new to the fundamental research of quantum mechanics, and our country has gifted many eminent quantum scientists to the world. The world has recognized the contributions of Acharya Satyendranath Bose in the name of bosons, Bose-Einstein statistics, and Bose-Einstein condensate. The beauty of quantum science is its speed and security, the superposition principle, the fundamental laws of quantum mechanics, the allows quantum computers to do the super fast calculations in exponential time using qubits, unlike the classical computers which use bits. The non-locality principle, that is the quantum correlations between particles, particles irrespective of their physical separation, and Heisenberg's uncertainty to principle, that is, any measurement disturbs the system, which is well known, uh, build uncon unconditional security, which finds its applications in quantum community. Today, we talk about various quantum applications. To name a few are quantum computers, quantum communication, the quantum sensing, the quantum materials, the superconducting quantum devices, the quantum information and network, quantum algorithms for computing and simulations, merger of artificial intelligence and quantum mechanics, unification of quantum mechanics and relativity theory. Among the many applications, the quantum communications is relatively more mature than others, as many speakers have told today. Also, it is more relevant to ISRO in terms of long distance quantum communication and quantum network, which can be realized with satellites. Thus, I would be focusing today on the perspectives of a satellite-based quantum communication and related to ISRO dose activities. Just a very short uh, introduction to all of you in case you are not aware of this. If you talk about the national scenario, Government of India has taken timely action to pave for the quantum way in a synergetic and systematic manner as quantum technologies constitute one of the nine verticals identified by Honorable Prime Ministers, Science, Technology, and Innovation Advisory Council, PMC Act, as all, all of you are aware. The Government of India has launched the National Mission, mission for Quantum Technologies and Applications, the NMQTA mission, to unlock the quantum potential of the country in participation with various ministries, departments, and academia like DST, MIT, DOT, DRDO, DOS, DAE, NRF, RRI, and uh, many other industries. The NMQTA mission has identified four key verticals, namely the quantum computation, the quantum communication, the quantum materials, and the quantum enabled technologies that cover quantum sensing and other advanced technologies like quantum atomic clock, quantum meteorology, etc. We are also all aware, as somebody has already mentioned, that NMQTA was announced in Union Budget of 2020 with a total outlay of rupees 8,000 crore for a period of five years. Very recently, there was a uh, empowered technical committee chaired by our uh, principal advisor, scientific advisor to Honorable Prime Minister, Professor Vijay Raghavan. And there also the modality with respect to how we need to proceed has been spelt out. To fulfill this budget announcement, a detailed project report DPR is prepared under the guidance of an DPR Apex Committee through the nationwide consultations of major stakeholders, uh, including the academia, the domain experts, the industry, the ministries, and other agencies. Now, coming to the ISRO context, ISRO Department of Space context. Chairman ISRO and Secretary Department of Space, being a member of the PMC Act, as well as a member of the Apex Committee of NMQTA, has mandated to make ISRO quantum-enabled 
and utilize the immense potential of quantum technologies for Indian space program. In line with the national efforts, ISRO and Department of Space has taken up specific mandates in the field of satellite-based quantum communication, SBQC as we call it, the quantum radar, QR, and also has plans to develop the technologies for quantum atomic clocks and quantum gyros, especially the atomic clocks will play a major part with respect to our navic constellation. The satellite-based quantum communication and quantum radar have already been part of ISRO's decadal plan now. ISRO has taken up the sustained satellite-based quantum communication program with a short as well as a long-term goal. In the short-term goal, ISRO's vision is to streamline the low-Earth orbit-based quantum key distribution, at least we are targeting by 2023, early 2023, I would say. The long-term goal targets to establish India's own quantum satellite constellation using LEO, NEO or LEO orbits by at least uh, not uh, later than 2030. ISRO and Department of Space also envision to build a national quantum network by integrating the satellite-based quantum communication with the optical fiber-based terrestrial quantum communication by joining hands with the Department of Telecommunication. As a subject of a bigger program, in order to induce the activities further, an ISRO Quantum Boom 2021 flagship program has been rolled out by Chairman ISRO and Secretary DOS with specific targets for the year 2021. Under this flagship program, ISRO has successfully demonstrated the free space quantum communication over a ground distance of 300 meters at Space Application Center, Ahmedabad. A number of key technologies were developed indigenously to accomplish this major feat, which included the use of indigenously developed navic receiver for time synchronization between the transmitter and the receiver modules, and the gimbal mechanism systems instead of the bulky large aperture telescopes for optical alignment. The 300 meter free space UKD demonstration has included live video conferencing using quantum key encrypted signals. This is a major milestone achievement towards the unconditionally secured satellite data communication using quantum technology. What are the future of, uh, or what is the future of space-based quantum science and technology as envisaged by ISRO? And as immediate targets for ISRO Quantum Boom 2021 flagship program, ISRO and Department of Space has identified a few milestones, which include, but of course, not limited to uh, the demonstration of free space entanglement based UKD with entangled photon source, the readiness of optical ground stations for satellite based quantum communication, to conduct experiments on quantum entanglement of photons, and uh, Homo Mandel HOM interferometry, the first technology demonstration of satellite based quantum communication between two Indian optical ground stations from an Indian satellite using both single photon and entanglement approaches with source on board the quantum satellite. While ISRO and Department of Space will develop quantum technologies for satellite-based quantum key distribution as well as quantum radar, the aspects of fundamental science also will be addressed by the scientists and engineers of ISRO. A few key scientific areas that will be explored include testing the effect of gravity, gravity on quantum entanglement between two satellites, one of which will be accelerated related to the other through Hoffman transfer, to conduct entanglement swapping experiment in space for relaying quantum information as a precursor experiment for establishing quantum satellite constellation, to con conduct experiment to study decoherence time of quantum states in microgravity environment towards understanding of challenges in onboard quantum computation and the quantum entanglement, to conduct Bose-Einstein condensate experiment and, det and detection of gravitational waves using BEC. And ISRO has initiated several technology development projects at its different centers and laboratories that will fit 
into the bigger picture of quantum enabled India. The department is working on war footing to establish India's quantum signature in the space sector, which will be beneficial for every Indian. In the second annual International India Quantum Technology Conclave, I would like to reiterate that country's quantum potential was shown in the past by our eminent scientists. And also I am happy to note that our country has enormous quantum potential. And today, ministries, Indian industries, institutes, and academia have come together, join hands to build a quantum enabled nation by unlocking this immense potential once again. I wish all of you and all of them a grand success. May God bless all of you. Stay safe and thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, can I request uh, Darshan Hiranandani, uh, Chairman of our Data Center Council, to kindly propose the vote of thanks and concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Varun. Uh, firstly, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Dr. Lavnish Chanana, uh, Chairman of the Asocham National Council on IT, ITS, and e-commerce. Uh, Dr. Chanana, that was a great summary of the entire conference and uh, some fantastic pointers from your end. Uh, my sincere thanks to uh, Simone Severini, who is uh, uh, up there at this late hour in the morning, and uh, thank you so much for that fantastic uh, uh, presentation and uh, I'm happy to say that uh, uh, our our data center at Yota, I mean our company has built almost uh, two thirds of the data centers that Amazon uses, uh, Amazon Web Services uses in India. And uh, uh, last but not the least, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Sri Uma Maheshwaran, uh, Scientific Secretary ISRO, for giving us a good overview of what ISRO is working on and wishing everybody all the very best. Uh, I just wanted to point out um, that from, from ASOCHAM's perspective, from the data center community's perspective and stakeholders' perspective, this is an area that we are watching with great intent. Uh, me personally, I'm focused on figuring out what is the kind of infrastructure, energy needs, space needs uh, that will be needed to get quantum computing off its feet and how industry can play a role in that. Uh, so I think this is a really exciting time of something truly new. And uh, while it is old, its applications are truly new. Uh, and immediately the areas of space, defense, uh, health and weather come to our mind because these are elements that everybody is working on uh, on a today basis. So I think we'll see lots of movement or first movement from the government, uh, both in terms of research and offtake. So I'm very excited for the grant on the focus by METI to get a, uh, to, to, as Dr. Chanana mentioned, to provide several thousand crores in this space uh, that will be government back. So that will give a huge boost. One area that I think we, we always miss out on in India is creating enough IP or intellectual property. And one of our biggest losses as an economy in the last 50 years, uh, we were a great economy before, but one of our biggest losses is we don't create enough IP. And I do hope and Asocham will convince our members, our uh, you know 350,000 members, uh, that they should be focused and working with people around them, helping scientists, uh, funding it, participating in it, so that IPs can be earned and owned in India, and that will take us very, very far ahead uh, in the quantum computing space. So with that, uh, last but not the least, I'd like to thank Varun and his team and the entire ASOCHAM team for putting this conference together. Uh, wishing you all the very, very best. Thank you. Uh, Varun, I think you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, I would also like to thank all my panelists and audience for joining us. And this uh, uh, brings the discussion to an end. We shall be making the recommendations of this session and would be seeking your help. I would be uh, sending a separate mail inviting all the speakers uh, today 
to share pointers on the recommendation and then we can take forward thank you all for joining thank you Namaskar. bye bye Yeah, thank you, Varun.